All right, everyone. So it's uh, it's 2 p.m. So I'm just going to go ahead and get started um, just because we have a lot of content to cover. Uh, so on behalf of the Muslim Medical Association of Canada, I'd like to welcome everybody to the COVID-19 emergency medicine refresher. Uh, my name is Bilal Lone. I'm a sports medicine physician in Hamilton, Ontario and a board member for the MMAC. Thank you for joining us today. I'm just going to give a quick shout out to the team members who have come together quickly to put the session together um, and uh, actually last week's session as well. So Dr. Arfid Malik, she's a PGY5 psychiatry at University of Toronto. Dr. Tanzila Basreen is a family medicine uh, physician in North York and ER physician in Lindsay, Ontario. Dr. Uh, Say Schwetz, she's a PGY4 emergency medicine at Univers University of uh, Saskatchewan, sorry. Dr. Nazia Sharfuddin, uh, PGY4 internal medicine at University of Alberta. Dr. Hamza Qureshi is a PGY4 internal medicine at University of Toronto. And Dr. Ahmed Faris, PGY3 public health and preventative medicine at University of Montreal. Um, so I'm just going to quickly introduce our speakers for today and then I'm going to hand over the mic to them because I don't like to speak for very long. Um, so we have Dr. Fanzila Bessereen. She's a practicing family physician currently working in North York. Uh, she trained at University of Toronto um, Family Medicine's North York General Site. She also works as a rural emergency physician in Lindsay, Lindsay Ontario. And then we have Dr. Say Schwetz is a PGY4 emergency medicine resident from the University of Saskatchewan, who is currently doing her pediatric emergency medicine fellowship in Edmonton with the University of Alberta. Her additional focuses include EMS and transport medicine, wellness and leadership in medicine. Um, so just give me one second. I'm just going to unmute our speakers so that they can get started. All right. All right so you're up. Okay, perfect. Okay, can everyone hear me okay? Or I'll let Bilal answer so we don't have a few hundred messages. Okay, perfect, thank you. Awesome. Okay, so. Let's get started. All right, so we have our slides. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Tenzila. I'm, um, like Bilal said, I'm a family physician who um, focuses more on eMERGE um, and I hope to be challenging my exam down the line. Um, and I'm here with the wonderful uh, Say Schwetz um, who will be um, providing you with an eMERGE refresher to our best ability. So just understand that eMERGE is everything and everything is eMERGE, okay? So there's a lot of content to cover. So I guess let's get started. So um, we don't have any conflicts of interest to declare. We don't have anything else really. Um, we're going to just you know let you know that these slides are current as of today, things can change. And so just um, letting you know that. Thank you to the Muslim Medical Association of Canada for organizing this um, and other lectures to come. Um, I know this is a critical time for all of us to get a nice refresher reminder of what um, these bread and butter specialties do. And so thank you for organizing this. So emergency medicine, um, we're looked at as the cowboys. So, you know, don't freak out. <laughs> Number one, just calm down. And um, I know this quote keeps getting thrown around, but nothing is an emergency in a pandemic. So usually you don't have to run for that um, trait kit and you don't need to cut off people's limbs. So, um, you know, we cover a lot of things, but the biggest thing is to remember that you have time, you have a team, um, go through your algorithms and you'll be great. And we'll go through all that with you today. But now, first, um, let's talk about PPE because um, we are seeing COVID everywhere. Everyone's freaking out. And we have people like this in the media. Start working I hope you guys can hear this. Your face because one main way viruses spread is when you touch your own mouth, nose, or eyes. So clearly, um, we're not taking our own advice. Today, so what do we do for COVID-19? When you're going to work, what are things that you need to be aware of? I really like this handout. Um, you know, no jewelry, not even studs, like don't wear anything, uh, don't wear rings, try to have your hair up, get everything um, as minimalistic as possible. If you're having your wallet, I, I usually just take my one credit card with me. I have my phone and that's really it. Avoid nail polish is something I've heard as well, but I don't think we have to be that intense. 
Um, but essentially just try to be as minimalistic as possible. At work, um, I think I'm gonna be starting to wear those um, hair covers. Uh, I'll have my hair up. Um, we might have gowns on at all times, I'm not sure yet. Um, we know that masks are um, limited, and so we're trying to keep them on as much as we can. Really don't touch your face um, and try your best to be um, mindful of your surroundings. After work, uh, a lot of people are going into the shower right away. Um, sanitize all your stuff, your keys, your um, phone especially, and all of that as much as you can. So it's just I uh, wanted to give that reminder to be really mindful of how we're working and what we're working, even if they're not coming in with those respiratory symptoms now. But let's get back to the cowboy stuff. So I will pass it off to Say. Just figuring out how to do that. Can you guys hear my slides and see me? Can't see you, but we can see your slides. Oh, okay. Sorry, we can't see your slides either, actually. How about now? Can we see you? Can you see my slides? I can see you. I don't see your slides. Okay. <laughs> sorry, just, just a small technical difficulty. Yep, your slides are up now. <clears throat> All right, awesome. So I get to talk about my favorite things in emergency medicine, aka trauma and resuscitation and emergency medicine. Um, I think the most important thing about working in the eMERGE is to like kind of always have an approach to what you're going to be seeing and what you're going to do next. So every time you pick up a chart and you go to see a patient, you're kind of running through a differential diagnosis, thinking about the labs you're going to need, thinking about what you're going to ask on history, what you're going to do on physical exam. And there's really no change to that approach when you're seeing a really sick patient either. So quick case, um, the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic is supposed to be kind of hitting us that end of April, beginning of May time, which is when the weather gets good and every 21 year old jumps on his motorcycle and goes for a rip. Uh, so that's when we start to see our, our motorcycle accidents and you get a patch from EMS saying you've got a 21 year old male, motor, our motorcycle versus truck, and his vital signs don't look awesome. He's got hyper, or he's got um, tachycardia, hypotension, tachypnea, decreased SpO2, bad GCS, and multiple injuries as per the scene. You've got a little bit of time before he gets there. So I want you to think to yourself, how are you gonna set up your resuscitation bay so that you're ready to take care of this patient? I always think of my preparation as all of my P's. So place, where am I gonna take my patient? Well, in this case, this patient definitely needs to go to a resuscitation bay that has you know, the ability to capture an airway, throw in a chest tube, do a massive transfusion, and even bring in imaging. The next thing you need to ask yourself is how do you protect yourself and the people that you'll be working with? And this is going to be something that becomes really important as we face this COVID-19 pandemic. Our use of PPE is going to be protecting us as healthcare workers so we can keep saving more lives. So um, always make sure you have that available and appropriately donned and later docked. The next thing you want to do is think about the people you need in the room to be successful. So when I'm considering a trauma or a resuscitation, I want my like best nurses who can get an IV, who needs to, who knows how to mix an epi, who can use a massive transfusion machine, and who has that really impressive closed loop communication that helps me manage the room effectively. I want an RT because if I need to capture an airway, I need their incredible skills at the bedside. Will I be needing lab, ECG, imaging? Can I call them and get them down and get them ready for that patient? Next up are products. So sometimes it's as simple as making sure you've laid a bed sheet on the, on the stretcher before the patient shows up so that if their pelvis is unstable, you can quickly bind it. Other times it includes making sure you have your chest tube and thoracotomy train nearby, all the equipment you would need to intubate, and your massive transfusion machine prepped and ready to go. Products here is where I kind of think, or sorry, pharmacologic agents here are when I think about my resuscitation medications and my RSI medications. So blood, TXA, warm normal saline, and then things like rock, ketamine, et cetera. And then last but not least is patient positioning. And this is kind of, again, where you want the bed to be in the middle of the room, who you want to have around it immediately, and where you want all your trays to be. So your chest tube tray on one side, your ultrasound on a different. When it comes to trauma and any resuscitation approach, I think we all know and have heard of ATLS, and they really have a very al algorithmic approach to taking care of a sick and potentially dying patient. Airway, breathing, circulation, disability, exposure, and then DEFG, so don't ever forget the glucose. Um, 
And, and I want to, I'll talk a bit more about um, an approach to airway management, because I think that's something that emergent airway capturing, it's, it's an emergency medicine skill. Um, but I just want to quickly touch on the key things I'm thinking about when I'm, I'm walking through a trauma resuscitation for each of these aspects. So when it comes to airway, I'm asking myself, is the patient able to protect their airway or will they be losing their airway shortly? So one of those would of course be their mental cognition status. So is their GCS decreasing? Do I expect them to get sicker? If yes, capture an airway. Um, the other is, is, is the airway actually damaged? So is there trauma to the face or the neck that would make the patient lose their airway at a later point? If the answer is yes, I'm going to capture that airway. When I think about breathing, the big things I'm looking for are signs of a pneumothorax, uh, especially a tension pneumothorax, or signs that they'll have disordered breathing, likely due to things like a sucking chest wound or a flail chest Circulation, of course, you're looking for the big areas where patients lose blood. So um, thorax, chest, like thorax and chest, abdomen, pelvis, long bones, scalp wounds and bleeds are pretty significant. And the last place patients will lose their blood is at the scene. So you won't even know how much blood they've lost before they come to the emergency department. If you think your patient is hemorrhaging, your goal is to stop the hemorrhage as quickly as possible. If by using a tourniquet for a limb, a pelvic binder for the pelvis, or the OR for things like the chest and the abdomen, replace their losses. Blood is better than normal saline in these instances. And then use your adjuncts like TXA to try and help with coagulation. And then um, the, the other thing you wanna think about is your patient's disability. When I'm doing a quick trauma assessment, it's, it's really quick. It's, it's assessment of their pupils. Are they equal? Are they reactive to light? It's assessment of their GCS. And if I'm unable to get a true GCS, I ask myself, Avku, are they alert? Are they verbal? Are they responding to pain? Or are they completely unresponsive? And then the last thing I wanna know is, is can they move all four limbs? Trauma patients need full exposure, front and back, including a log roll. Depending upon the trauma incidents, you will need to get a DRE to assess for rectal tone and also for trauma. And then um, last but not least, don't ever forget that glucose because you'd hate to have a hypoglycemic patient in a trauma bay getting sicker because of a metabolic derangement that we haven't yet recognized. We do know that sometimes patients come into the emergency department after a trauma that's actually caused by the fact that they're hypoglycemic, but we're just thinking motor vehicle accident, something weird happened. So always make sure you're checking that glucose. The last thing I'll add here is the importance of avoiding that uh, triad of death in trauma. So avoid um, coagulation disorder, acidemia, and hypothermia. And one of the easiest ways to avoid hypothermia is to jack up the temperature in the room and make sure your patient is covered as much as possible when they're not being examined. So I think that um, it's really impossible to give you the information needed to be a, an emergency medicine expert in the space of two hours. So I'd rather just give you resources. So this is your ATLS resource. If you use the camera on your phone and you scan that weird black and white box on the left corner of your screen, it'll pop up with a link that'll take you to my ATLS and you can actually download like their whole um, textbook. It costs money, but if it's something that you're interested in, it's a really great resource. Another awesome resource is the Arrow Easy IO app. I'm an Apple user, so this will take you to the Apple App Store. Um, but this app goes through how to place an IO emergently with graphics and videos. It also walks through all of the contraindications to placing an IO so that you put it in the right spot. I think that in my four years of doing an emergency medicine resuscitation, an IO has been life-saving like multiple times. It's a really simple procedure, clean the skin, make sure there's no fractures or signs of infection above the bone and throw in an IO. Um, I highly recommend downloading this app. It's a great way to refresh yourself before you walk into that trauma room or resuscitation as well. And then um, if you're someone like me who doesn't do great learning in a classroom, really doesn't like to read, has all that emergency medicine ADHD, but does okay with videos, I highly recommend the MRAP procedural videos. This doc is the best at explaining how to do a procedure in an efficient and effective way. She goes through contraindications, indications, and any possible troubleshooting you might have to deal with along the way. So when you get access to these slides later, if you actually push on the video here, it'll take you to the YouTube video for putting in a chest tube. Now, I wanna spend a little bit of extra time focusing on what it is to manage an emergent airway. Um, like I said, in emergency medicine, we are expected to know how to capture a, a rapidly disappearing airway in a safe and effective manner that doesn't put our patients at risk. 
So in doing that, I want you to, again, think about your indications of intubation. So inability to maintain airway patency. And I mentioned this earlier, do they have vascular or other trauma to the neck that's gonna make swelling happen and their airway disappear? Capture the airway. Have they been in a fire in a house in an enclosed building and their airway is covered with soot and they're gonna get lots of airway edema? Capture that airway. Um, if they're unable to protect against aspiration, so for example, head trauma, decreased level of consciousness, capture the airway. If they can't ventilate, if they can't oxygenate, or if we know that their projected clinical course is going to require intubation and sedation, capture the airway. Now, in trauma, the signs to intubate that I always think of start with S. So strider, soaring, significant secretions, smash to the face, and soot in the back of the throat signifying um, airway edema secondary to uh, burn and thermal injury. Then again, when you go back to um, managing your airway, I always think of um, intubating a patient as one of the most critical moments of their care because we have the ability to uh, cause significant damage and even death if, we, if it's done wrong. So again, I run through my P's. I make sure I'm in the right place. I'm wearing my appropriate PPE. I have an RT. Or if the airway is really bad and scary, I've called for extra help. Anesthesia, ENT, general surgery if I'm worried about having to do a crack. I make sure I have the right tools, a size down, including as well in case there's unforeseen um, anatomic difficulties in the airway requiring a tinier intubation um, endotracheal tube. The right pharmacologic agents. And so here, um, <clears throat> I work a lot with STARS. Um, I've done some rotations with them, getting the chance to fly with their team. I've done some of their education days, and I've had the chance to pick their brains about what they do when they're on the scene in a weird environment, having to capture patient airway. And they like to keep things really simple. So in most cases, using rocuronium for your paralytic and ketamine for your sedative agent is effective. I always tell myself when it comes to picking the dose of sedative, um, how sick is my patient? If my patient is 90% sick, I would use 10% of their normal sedative dosing agent. If they're only 50% sick, then I would use 50% of, of their normal dosing um, sedative agent. And that's kind of like a rough math way of approaching um, dosing of your sedative agent without tanking their, their pressure. And then the last thing here that's really important is that patient positioning. So really getting that good sniffing position with the ears and the sternal notch perfectly aligned. I find this is especially important in pediatric intubations where they have that huge octopus compared to their body and you need to put a towel roll under their shoulders. And then in your morbidly obese patients where sometimes you're ramping them and sitting them at like a 45, 60 degree angle to bring their airway in line with their sternal notch. And then tools, I like to give tools. So um, you can bag valve mask your way out of almost any difficult situation. Good BVM will save lives. Think about the reasons why you might not have good BVM. So bearded patients are hard to bag. Obese patients, hard to bag. Old patients, they're really hard to bag. And so are toothless patients, patients with structural abnormalities or patients with lots of secretions. And every time I see the word secretions, I remind myself to check my suction and make sure it's functioning. If they have lots of secretions, have a second suction up and ready to go. <clears throat> when you're assessing an airway and looking for signs of anatomic predictors of difficulty, I use the lemons mnemonic. So how does the patient look externally? Do they have structural signs of a difficult airway? So for example, microagnathia with a really short chin. Do they have a giant tongue? Do they have poor tone at baseline? Those would be your external, or do they have a horrific facial smash because of an injury? Those would be your external signs. Then you evaluate your three, three, two. So the first three is can the patient fit three of their own fingers in their mouth? Kind of then can, you, can they fit three of their own fingers underneath their chin, kind of um, from the, uh, the bone of the chin down to the edge of the neck? And then the two is, is between the end of the hyoid bone to the top of the cricoid. If you're able to fit those fingers in those spaces, then you know that they've got pretty good space inside their mouth to actually fit all the tools you need to use to capture that airway. I assess the melon patty, which is the passive opening of the patient's mouth to see how much space they have between the soft palate and their uvula. And then I look for uh, other external markers that, that might be a hard airway like obesity or other obstructing areas like a C-spine. If I'm able to, I have the patient range their neck to see if I'm going to be able to get that sniffing position. And then again, I look for secretions because I got to make sure I've got my suction. And then I, I, I have an approach that I run through every time before I capture an airway. Like I said, um, doing this wrong can lead to really 
horrific adverse outcomes. And so if you have an algorithmic approach to making sure you don't miss anything before you capture an airway, then you're setting yourself up for success. Um, I played a lot of hockey growing up. And one of my favorite coaches always said that by preparing, by failing to prepare, you're preparing to fail. And I think this really um, connects well to capturing an airway. So I make sure I have my drugs. I make sure I have my patient appropriately prepared. I have all the equipment I need to capture their airway. And then I run through my plan. So I ask myself, are there sources of anatomic difficulty, as discussed when we were going through the lemons algorithm, or are there signs of physiologic difficulty? So is my patient incredibly tachypnic? Are they excessively hypotensive? Are they in obstructive shock? And they're really preload dependent? Are they incredibly acidotic like in a DKA? If those things are there, I'm going to do my best to reverse and alleviate those physiologic barriers before I capture their airway because transitioning to a positive pressure airway and losing the patient's drive to blow up their own CO2 are two easy ways to put you in a bad position. And then once I'm sure that I'm good to go and safe to move ahead, I talk about my plan with all the people in the room. So I talk about what meds I'm going to use and my process to capturing their airway. First approach being DL, second approach video, prepared for a surgical airway as needed, and my backup plan would be an LMA. Kind of walking through all of those different steps, saying that if all else fails and I can't oxygenate and I can't ventilate, then I would do a surgical airway. And here's just where I say again, resuscitate before you intubate you can easily kill a patient by switching them to positive pressure ventilation or by taking away their own personal respiratory drive. And in those instances, I strongly, strongly recommend that you resuscitate your patient before you try to put a tube down their throat. Because sometimes you need to go quickly, here is a formula for making a push dose presser for epinephrine. So what you do is you take um, a 10 mil syringe and you fill it with nine mils of normal saline. And then you add one mil of cardiac epinephrine, the one in 10,000 concentration. That gives you an epi concentration of 10 micrograms per mil. And you can dose that between 0.5 to two mils per minute IV as needed for pressure support. This works in about a minute, so don't give it and expect immediate onset. You wanna see that it kind of, um, uh, you wanna see it have effect before you start dosing again, because there is a risk of overdosing and causing hypertension, which can have its own bad side effects, especially with things like traumatic brain injury. And then it'll last for five to 10 minutes, but titrate as needed, of course. So now that I've talked about airways, I'm gonna hand things over to our girl Tanzilla, and she will take over on shock. All right, I'm back. Okay, so let me get this started. Okay. So thank you, Say. That's a perfect segue to talk about shock. So like she said, um, how do we deal with people who are actively trying to die basically through shock? Um, so what is shock? Shock is basically when you don't have enough tissue perfusion and um, not enough oxygen gets there. And we love to categorize things and we have mnemonics and I know there's four types of shock, but I'm going to tell you that we're going to split it up into five by calling it shock. So um, the first one, septic, hypovolemic, obstructive, cardiogenic, and I know the K doesn't make sense, but just bear with me. Um, so that's your kind of quick approach to what they might be coming in with. So my general approach for treating shock um, really goes back to a lot of what Say has said. So resuscitate and stabilize the vitals, right? So we want to still look at the airway, ensure it's patent. If um, you're concerned, intubate, especially if they're really not um, with it. Um, you want to check their breathing. So is there good air entry bilaterally? Start them on some nasal prongs um, and kind of plan ahead, like Say had said. Um, do you need to intubate? Do you need a ventilator? Where, what direction are we kind of going at if this is an unstable patient? Um, and then circulation. So IV fluids, what are we going to give? How are we going to give it? What are, what's our access? So say talked about the IVs, obviously our first line. If you don't have it and the patient's tanking, the pressure is like 70 over something and um, you want to put in that uh, IO. And some people were asking, so IO is just the intraosseous, so you're going right into the bone, uh, drilling in, getting um, direct access into um, the circulation system. Um, something I want to highlight is that um, normal saline is preferred, and that's because it's um, very inert. It, you have minimal interactions, whereas ringer's lactate, which might work, but then it might uh, have various contraindications depending on what you're going to give. 
And all of these kind of, you're monitoring to response, you're monitoring to the vitals. Are, are the vitals improving? Um, and you're monitoring to see um, improvement in end organ dysfunction. And we'll talk more about that as we uh, go on. So the first type of shock. So um, my, detail, my slides uh, here are more detailed because I think Say has given a really good uh, visual representation of the specific nitty gritties of how we're gonna manage um, in terms of the procedural side. And I'm gonna focus on how do we diagnose, when do we worry and what um, is the common kind of management pathway. And all of these slides will be given to you guys. So um, you don't have to jot down things really quickly. So septic shock is warm shock. So they're flush, they're warm, very faint pulses. And essentially the mechanism is that you have vasodilation everywhere, right? Sepsis by definition requires an infection. So you have to have an infection plus one of the um, signs of shock essentially, um, which could be um, two or more of what we call Q-SOFA. So um, is their GCS uh, impaired? Um, are they tachypnic? And is their pressure low? So that's just your sepsis criteria. Now, what about septic shock? So now we're talking about patients who are septic, but they're uh, potentially requiring pressors. They're requiring a lot of fluids to keep their pressures up, um, or their serum lactate is greater than two. That's also a good way um, of thinking about it. The shock index um, is a great tool to really aid your clinical gestalt, which you already have. So if the heart rate is greater than your systolic blood pressure, this person then is probably gonna need more aggressive resuscitation. How do you manage the person? So first do a head to toe, look for the source of infection. This is guided by your history, your exam, but don't be fooled by just history. So definitely do a thorough check. Um, most common things being common, pneumonia and pilo. Um, and other things that we often tend to forget is when you, you know, examine the skin, look for cellulitis, look for bone issues, check the abdomen, are they uh, coming in with an abdo complaint? Workup is very extensive. Um, if they're coming in with septic shock and you have very little to work on. You know, you want to do a full abdominal panel, um, add BBG and lactate on there, add blood cultures times two. So that means from two different sites, the nurses should know. Uh, urine culture, sputum culture, if it's indicated, wound culture, if you see a wound, and the list goes on. Chest x-ray, if you're suspecting a pneumonia, abdominal ultrasound versus CT, you know, again, depends on how clinically stable they are. Um, sometimes we do a quick fast ultrasound to make sure um, Although with sepsis, not sure how useful that would be. Um, and an LP if you're thinking of meningitis, encephalitis, and all of that. Treatment, if we want to keep it broad, IV fluids are your best friend. And I'll go into more detail. Broad spectrum antibiotics early on. Source control. So is it a line? Do they have a pick line? Do they have um, an abscess or something? You want to get rid of that infection. And um, if, you know, if they're pretty unwell, we put in a Foley to monitor urine output. So IV fluids. So the guidelines really say that you should do 30 cc's per kilogram of normal saline within the first three hours of them coming in to emerge. Now, realistically speaking, we have a lot of people with a lot of comorbidities, and that could be CHF or liver um, and other conditions that would really make the volume overloaded very quickly. So, you know, calculate your 30 cc bolus, but give it in smaller uh, boluses, um, and reassess based on their vitals. So we don't want to create a new problem of having volume overload, but we also want to be more aggressive. So I usually start off with one to two liters on an adult patient, and then I reassess and give that second liter, third liter, fourth liter, or whatever may be needed. Um, ringers, again, can be good, but like I said, interactions do exist. So ceftriaxone is actually contraindicated with ringers. So just stick to normal saline if you have a pretty undifferentiated patient. Um, pressors. So, uh, say I already talked about a few um, pressor options. Um, I gave my go-to. So, if I have a septic patient, they're um, euvolemic and, and they're still hypotensive despite maybe their third, fourth liter of fluid, um, I'm going to start a presser and, and kind of get ICU involved early on. And so, that's really um, levofed. Um, you can titrate 2 to 30 micrograms per minute. And again, the nurse can help you with that. Um, if you want a quick help for uh, blood pressure control, I actually uh, draw up some phenylephrine. So it's um, 100 micrograms per mil. And the way I've been kind of taught in the ICU is you're supposed to give 100 micrograms 
or 100 micrograms should correlate with a, a 10 increase in systolic blood pressure. So it's pretty quick. You kind of, uh, it's a push dose. So give one cc at a time just to keep that systolic up while maybe levofed or something else is kicking in. And so that's kind of my go-to. Um, levofed is still first line for sepsis, um, for septic shock. There are other things you can give epi, which is actually pretty good as well. Uh, vasopressin, methylene blue, less so uh, used for um, sepsis itself. Next, antibiotics. So you want to be giving antibiotics within the first three hours, but obtain your blood cultures first. Always, always, always get the nurse to do the blood cultures ASAP and then start your antibiotics. If it's really, if they're not getting a peripheral line, it's really hectic, you're not able to get the blood culture and they're not well, start the antibiotics, right? Like realistically speaking, you have to follow your clinical um, uh, gestalt. So in terms of antibiotic choices, we can go through like a whole lecture on ID and, um, you know, I'm not an expert, why go through that? Um, but we have resources, like Say said. So an amazing resource is the University Health Network Antimicrobial Stewardship Site. I put it on there, but you could just literally search Google UHN uh, Antimicrobial Stewardship. You're going to have every infection that you can think of in the emergency department and how to manage it. It talks about the different antibiotics. If someone is um, allergic to something, you have all your options. It even has a COVID-19 sheet, um, which could be helpful to um, a lot of you. So um, I will leave that there. And source control. Like I said, if there's an abscess, we need to drain it. If there is a line that is infected, a Foley catheter that's been there for weeks and looks really um, nasty, you know, we need to replace it. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, just, yeah. just before you move on, um, yeah. somebody had a question about this slide in particular. Um, mm -hmm. If you could just clarify what you meant by septriaxone being contraindicated with ringers is what, what the question was. Um, so I think there's a relative contraindication, and I think it's about the bioavailability of ceftriaxone. I have to look up the exact thing, but I know um, I had to speak to the pharmacist um, one time with ceftriaxone and ringers. We, we often don't read it, but it's, it, there's actually an interaction there. So it, it can impact your dosing. Uh, if anyone else knows more, is that a... I can, I can clarify that more in terms of exactly what happens. Um, when we send out the slides, okay? Um, so next, hypovolemic shock. So um, based on Say's example, that person with a MVC motor vehicle accident um, comes in, they're cold, really faint pulses. Um, you know, we're worried about volume loss. We're worried about blood loss in that case. Um, in trauma, GI bleeds, um, we're worried about blood loss, and we're also worried about um, fluid loss uh, if they're coming in as a burn victim or um, crazy gastro or some sort of other um, process involved. And so, you know, in cold shock, you, again, want to be almost as thorough. Um, and you want to order your CBC, make sure that they're not bleeding out somewhere, or if they are, how fast. You want to get your uh, abdominal panel going and your coag. So INR and PTT really important. Um, fibrinogen I often add if I'm uh, truly concerned with the patient. And please, 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 please do not forget beta HCG. Like always, always, if they're a young woman, rule out ectopic rupture. Okay, um, those can deteriorate really fast, and so um, don't forget that's part of your uh, shock workup. It's part of your trauma workup. Um, your abdo pain workup, beta HCG. Other things that uh, we do are the fast ultrasound, looking for free fluid in the abdomen. Um, we can do a chest x-ray, uh, ECG, you know, they may come in with um, this cold shock, but um, maybe there could be a silent MI involved. Um, and so there's a whole other kind of, based on your history, physical, uh, you can do a lot more workup. Treatment, again, we're focusing on our ABCs and resuscitation. So trauma, uh, I won't go through this too much, uh, but essentially get that ATLS app um, and say slides kind of go through that a bit more. So GI bleeds are a really common thing that we see. Um, I'm just gonna pause for one second. Um, okay, so GI bleeds is a really, really common eMERGE presentation. So again, this is someone who comes in, um, sometimes they can look really well actually, um, but sometimes they come looking really cold um, and 
crazy abnormal vitals. So the thing we have to remember is, you know, history is really important to figure out where this bleeding is coming from. So we're looking for history of nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea, but that's not it. What about vomiting? Is it hematemesis? Is it coffee ground emesis? Or is it just regular uh, vomiting? Um, do we have bright red stool or do we have black tarry stools, which could be more indicative of an upper GI versus bright red for a lower GI bleed? And that really, you know, changes our approach to uh, how quickly the patient might deteriorate. For upper GI bleeds, um, the older patients usually um, come in with peptic ulcer disease, maybe ruptured, maybe bleeding ulcer, um, gastritis, remember to ask about alcohol there, um, esophagitis. Um, younger patients, Mallory Westers are common, so this could be a drug guy who, who you know, had um, a lot of vomiting the night before or this morning, and then all of a sudden, oh my God, I'm bleeding, right? Um, GI varices, if they have a history of um, liver failure, or liver issues, um, and the list goes on. Lower GI bleed, I, I usually have my ABCD. I know we use that like endlessly, um, but so my ABCD is AV fistula. Uh, so any um, aerodovenous uh, abnormalities essentially. Um, IBD is a common one. So Crohn's ulcerative colitis can have some rectal bleeding. Cancer is a, another one, um, although they don't present as, um, as unwell, usually it, unless it's a new bleed. From the cancer and colitis. So this could be ischemic colitis, it could be um, or infectious colitis. So that's something definitely uh, the history could guide you as well. And diverticulitis usually does not lead to bleed, but um, I just have that on my list. Workup, same stuff. Okay, remember, um, you know, you want to be thorough, you want to have your CBC. We're trying to figure out if there's blood loss or if it's fluid loss. We're looking at the creatinine, looking for AKIs and things like that type and screen that's so 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 important you know sometimes they come out really well and then all of a sudden they have a brisk bleed and um, we need blood products at hand okay um, again coags inrptt and fibrinogen uh, again beta and i'm and i really want to repeat these so that it kind of gets drilled inside your mind that these are really crucial things to be adding to your workup fast ultrasound maybe not so useful in this case um, and our treatment again like the other cold shocks, um, resuscitate and then treat based on what you need. So for resuscitation here, so first thing they come in, we're getting the nurse, can you please put in two large bore IVs? Uh, what does large bore mean? So 16, 14, whatever they can get in. Um, IO, if you're not able to get it, um, 20 cc per kilogram is our usual bolus dose. Um, I usually like giving 500 cc and then reassessing because they're sometimes not as um, unwell. Again, this will depend on the clinical appearance. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, a lot of people with GI bleeds are older and they have CHF, they have other comorbidities. So I just want to be a little bit careful with the fluids. And you don't want to cause um, coagulopathy by giving so much fluid and uh, not really addressing the fact that you need blood, right? So. Um, what are the indications to give blood? So really hemoglobin less than 70 is when they get symptomatic and that's when I really start giving blood. Otherwise they're not as bad. Again, if your vitals are really off and they're not responding to fluids well, um, I would start sooner, obviously. If they're actively bleeding, start um, your packed red blood cells. And, um, you know, two liters is kind of my threshold for fluids because after that I, I really do risk the dilutional anemia and coagulopathy that you see with an active bleed. Um, and if you know it's a variceal bleed, you're going to need blood products. So just be prepared. So um, one unit of blood should really give you uh, an increase in hemoglobin by 10 units. If you're not getting that, they're actively bleeding and it's fast. And so, you know, usually you give these uh, blood products over four hours to prevent volume overload, but it can be faster if you think they're having an active uh, severe bleed. You might want to consider activating your massive transfusion protocol in some hospitals. That's called Code Omega. I don't know what it would be at your local site, but that basically means that your hospital is reserving all blood products for this patient and you have really fast access. Um, and um, one of the reasons to do that would be if you're needing more than 10 units of blood um, over 24 hours. And sometimes you end up needing 10 units over like a few hours alone. Other things to add uh, would be fresh frozen plasma. 
So something I really want to talk about that we, I found that I didn't get uh, enough uh, learning on was how much, you know, fluid do these things have? So it's about 250 to 350 cc. So you can imagine if you're using 10 units of something, that's like two and a half to three and a half liters of extra fluid that you're giving. So if they have CHF or CKD, you want to give them Lasix beforehand or after, just really have a low threshold for that because you don't want to um, put them into volume overload. Again, um, airway breathing. So if you notice, I kind of switched it. So here I went into the CABC because we know that circulation is so important with this GI bleed. And so um, if they're alert, you know, focus on the circulation. If, if not, if you're worried that they're vomiting and they might have an aspiration and they're lightheaded, whatnot, you want to protect that airway and intubate early on. Okay, so other medications. So what else do we have? So we have um, vitamin K. So if you know someone is on warfarin, they're coming with a GI bleed, you do want to um, uh, reverse it. So 10 milligrams IV, um, cryoprecipitate, fresh frozen plasma we talked about, and octoplex is another one. So these are all things you want to talk uh, to the specialist uh, before maybe giving. Maybe the ICU specialist would be great. Um, and other things that we sometimes use, also used in trauma, is TXA. So that's tranexamic acid. Um, and so the usual dose is one gram, you push over 10 minutes. And then the second gram, um, sorry, I'll move the picture, but the second gram is over eight hours. Um, for um, a younger patient, uh, there is uh, a dosing per kilogram. And so I put that over there. And if you know it's a upper GI bleed or you're suspecting one, Panto is key. So start that. I usually just add that with my orders right away. Along with fluids, um, I'm starting uh, Pantoprazole. We, we've found um, that infusion is not necessarily superior. So I just go with the 40 IV Q12. Um, and then octreotide, you're probably not going to be giving it in a merge. Um, but you know some of the GIs like to give octreotide if we're thinking of a variceal bleed. Essentially, the way it works is it causes um, um, visceral vasoconstriction, and so it's decreasing um, the venous flow to the varices um, and hopefully calming down the bleed. And lastly, but most importantly, call for help, right? So you want to get gen surge on early. Uh, they need to prepare for a scope potentially if it's a brisk bleed. Uh, you might get vascular surgery for embolization. You might get IR involved. So, you know, know your team, know who to call and get them involved early. Okay, so uh, let's talk about burns. So how um, do we go with burns? So I know with bleeds and whatnot, we're thinking, um, you know, we're losing a lot of fluid through the, through the bleeding itself. But with burns, you know, we really have to think about it more than just circulation. And so again, go back to your ABCs and um, focus on looking at the patient. So when I'm walking in, I'm looking at the patient and seeing, are they breathing okay? Do they have soot around their mouth? In which case I'm worried about an inhalation injury. Start humidified oxygen, get your intubation kit, hopefully ready before they even came in because EMS probably will give you a heads up. Again, I'm talking about a really unwell patient in that case. Um, and looking at their breathing, are they distressed? Um, could, could I be, should I be worried about carbon monoxide poisoning, right? Um, so kind of get that ready and then move on to your circulation. We know that burnt patients um, do need a lot of fluids. Um, and the goal is to still resuscitate with the 20 cc per kilo bolus. And I think some people often, um, sorry, one second. All right, um, and so some people often forget that you still have to give your bolus. Everyone talks about the Parkland formula, which I'll talk about later, but you wanna give your bolus first and then talk about maintenance fluids, okay? So um, if it's a minor burn, oral is fine, as long as you know that there's no oral injury. Um, otherwise, IV fluids are kind of what I would start. Again, um, all of this is based on your clinical picture. And so then you move on to disability, and this includes glucose. It includes um, their neurological status and other signs of shock. These patients can deteriorate pretty quickly. And if there's chemical burns or other things, there might be um, other things to watch out for. 
but I guess go back to your ABCDE approach, expose, remove everything and calculate estimated body surface area. So how do we do that? So uh, you can follow the rule of nines or you can follow the palm trick. So essentially the patient's palm should be 1% of their body surface area. And so for kind of burns everywhere, I mean, if, I, if it's an adult, I'm using my palm and I just kind of visualize how many uh, percentages that might be. Um, personally, I find that to be the best because people don't come in with a full on burn, they may. Um, but I find it's more scattered. It's like this oil injury and it's like all over. So um, the palm trick is great. Otherwise, the rule of nines, as you can see with this picture, is really useful. Um, you can just Google that whenever you need it and kind of draw it into the picture is um, what I do. So let's say you have someone who was cooking on the stove. They have a minor burn on their hand. Uh, it looks red. It's maybe starting to blister. What do you do? So, you know, if if it's only less than 5% um, of their body surface area. It's not in like on their mouth. It's not something that's crazy worrisome right now. It's not on their face. Um, I'm going to give them proper pain meds. Um, I'm going to give them tetanus if it's second degree or more. So what does that mean? So if, if it's open, if the wound has opened or if there's a blister. Um, uh, I often tell them to put polysporin or mupirocin or something like that, but really polysporin works. Um, and I put those synthetic dressings, that's really important because if that burn, if the blister breaks and then you have this open wound, all the nerve endings are exposed. And so when you're going to change the dressing and if, it, if you have that dry gauze stuck onto your skin, it is brutally painful. So just make sure you're using the, the synthetic dressings that don't stick. Um, blisters. So people love popping blisters. <laughs> Please don't pop them. Um, so you want to leave them intact because it, it acts as a barrier to protect them from infection. So if it's really um, uncomfortable for them and you're not able to dress it properly, you're, you're thinking, okay, it's probably going to pop anyways. Aspiration's fine with a sterile needle, um, but I, I like to just leave it if I can. Um, and so I guess that's your minor burn uh, workup and then ask them to follow up with their family doctor. So how about the ones that are more extensive or they're on the face, they're like, they're just causing a lot of issues, the patient's uh, not tolerating the pain. Uh, what do you do then? So again, um, I go back to my analgesia. I go, I definitely give them tetanus in this case. And um, I start by, you know, exposing, once I've seen everything, I'm gonna put moist uh, saline soaked dressing if I can. If it's really large, just sterile drape um, over the area is fine. Um, so a lot of people ask about, you know, do we, do we put cold water? Do we put running water? What do we do? That's really only effective at home. That's effective in the first 30 minutes. And after that, um, you know, if there's a clear, um, dirt or something like that, we want to irrigate it for sure. But the 30 minutes doesn't necessarily help as much after, um, and never put ice to the wound. It's, it's really not, um, as helpful, but cold, something cold, a cold pack or whatnot might be helpful, but um, direct ice is not good. Um, after that, um, let's say we've given their bolus fluids. Uh, now we want to calculate what they might need in the next 24 hours. And we know burn victims need a lot of fluids in the following 24 hours if it's a big burn. So how do we do that? So for patients who are coming in and they have, um, essentially more than 15 to 20% body surface area, we're gonna to try to implement the Parkland formula. And um, for this, I just wanna remind people, this is a maintenance fluid uh, that you're calculating. So essentially four milliliters times the body surface area you've calculated times their weight is the total amount you're giving in 24 hours. You then divide that in half. And then once you have that half amount, you divide that by eight to know your per hour rate of fluids you're giving. The remaining half you're gonna divide by 16 and give it after that eight hour has completed to fulfill the 24 hour uh, period for fluids. Again, along with that, I'm still gonna give their analgesia, maybe antiemetics, I'm gonna give them tetanus and I'm going to call my burn specialist ASAP, right? Um, even with the moderate burns, I really do like talking to them. They often wanna see them in follow-up and um, again, really important. The rest of the management stays the same. 
All right. So I found a really good visual um, that I found was helpful. Um, I won't go into this in too much detail, but essentially less than 5% you can consider if you're sending them home once you've removed everything. And then um, for the more the critically want, ill ones, you know, you want to look at airway, you want to get uh, an IV, you want to get their fluids in um, and uh, get really good pain control. So let's shift gears a little bit. Um, everybody stretch a little bit because you're going to, you have a, you have a tough case coming. Okay. So EMS calls and they're like, okay, hey, we have this guy, um, 56, we're bringing him in. He's pretty, pretty like short of breath. Um, uh, and so essentially the history is he was feeling faint and weak this morning. Um, he's been sick with a cough, a fever, uh, runny nose. And, you know, the wife thought that he had a flu, but 30 minutes ago, he got so short of breath that the wife panicked and called the ambulance. And so he's, he's sitting here um, waiting to see you um, and his wife is panicking. What do you do? So start with history. Um, so history is pretty, pretty good. So he has hypertension, dyslipidemia, nothing crazy, no surgeries, pretty healthy otherwise. Um, Ex-smoker, immunizations are all up to date um, and no allergies, so that's great. All right, so let's move on to the physical. So we're looking at the vitals and hmm, he's a little bit tacky. His pressure is pretty soft. Um, his sats are borderline okay. I'm a little bit worried here. Um, and neurologically, he looks pretty good, but he, he's, he's just very short of breath. So he's, he's alert, he can talk to me, but he feels short of breath here. I'm listening to his chest and I can, I can hear air entry, uh, but I hear crackles both sides. I'm not really sure what's going on there. Um, I can hear S1, S2, but it's a little bit faint and his pulses are a little bit faint, but they're there. Abdomen, pretty normal, soft, no guarding, nothing and skin looks good. Um, I, I see a little bit of swelling in the ankles. I'm not sure if that's new or old, but that's kind of what I'm seeing. So I guess just reading that, I, I'm, not, I'm not too comfortable. Like, I mean, we'll make you comfortable after this lecture, but you know, something is up here and we, we need to be um, careful. So are you shook yet? I mean, we talked a lot about shock, but um, I don't know about you, but I'm a little bit. So, Oh, did not mean to repeat that. Um, so what's on your differential? And I'm, I'm just going to open my, um, the chat section quickly. What are people thinking? Let's see, how do I do this? Can I see the chat? Oh, shoot. If you just hover over the top. Yep, uh, I got it. I got it. So I have some people write, oh, there's a lot going on. Sepsis, CHF, uh, pneumonia, viral pneumonia, septic shock, COVID, um, ACS, septic shock. So lots of like pneumonia, sh septic shocky pictures. Okay, cool, cool. Let's now switch to um, his ECG. Just going to go back and forth like this for you guys. Um, so what are we seeing here? Yeah, someone wrote it. What, what could cause, like, what do we do next? So I, I'll, I decided to get a portable x-ray. Let's, let's get that x-ray. This is what we're seeing. Okay, someone wrote echo, please. Okay, tap it. Okay, cool. So, you know, we're seeing um, a definite abnormal chest x-ray over here. Um, and, okay, cool. So I think we're all getting to what we might see with this. So, so I got that echo. So here's what it looks like. Again, are we seeing it? I think we are. That heart is flopping around. Um, so yes, what we have here is obstructive shock. And um, our obstructive shock in this case, as you've probably all guessed, is cardiac tamponade. And we'll go into more detail there. But what is obstructive shock? So basically, this is when our blood flow from the heart is obstructed for some reason. And that the most common causes here 
are one tamponade because it's as you can see the fluid is just so much around the heart that the heart is just just flopping around it really can't uh, fill up and hence can't um, give proper outflow uh, tension pneumothorax you know all that air is squeezing the heart so it can't fill up and again can't give enough output and a PE is the other one our workup like we did ECG then chest x-ray maybe a bedside ultrasound in this case you know we found a pericardial effusion um, and if we're thinking you know all of that is negative then you got to rule out a PE okay so oops okay so again with tamponade our heart sounds are faint JVP is elevated just because you're not filling in enough uh, in the heart and so there's some backflow bedside ultrasound is pretty definitive um, and ECG and chest x-ray can help but you know your bedside ultrasound is your key what do we do? Pericardiocentesis to the subcycloid space. Um, I am not going to go into exactly how. Look up YouTube videos, you'll know. Um, but it is, um, you know, more and more we're using ultrasound guidance to do that. And so there's nothing that I could show you right now um, that would help you more than a YouTube video or something of that sort. And IV fluids to maintain blood pressure because we still want to give more um, uh, filling pressures. So tension pneumothorax is the other one. So in this case, we're going to hear, you know, one side, there's no air entry, um, elevated JVP as well, and the trachea is deviated to the opposite side. So as you can imagine, it's a closed space, you have so much air inside, and it's going to push everything to the other side. Um, the diagnosis really for tension pneumo should be clinical, because if you're waiting for that chest x-ray, it's, it's just too late, because they're in shock. Um, again, needle thoracostomy is um, the usual thing. So, you know, you feel your clavicle go down um, to intercostal spaces and on the top of that second rib, uh, sorry, third rib, uh, on top of the third rib is where you're going to go in. You don't want to go below the upper rib because that's where your nerves go. So you're on the top of the next rib um, for that um, thoracostomy. But more and more, we're actually moving into finger thoracostomy because it's faster, it gets more air out. Um, and for that, you're at the fifth intercostal space between the anterior and uh, mid axillary uh, line. Again, um, look up YouTube videos, look up um, pictures for your landmarks for that. Um, so the other one we have is pulmonary embolism. And I, I, won't, I won't go into too much detail here because I think Say will do an amazing job of this. Again, here, anticoagulation is our number one goal. So next shock, cardiogenic. I know um, these talks are long. So we're going to just uh, push through and get uh, our shock uh, done. So the other form of cold shock is cardiogenic shock. And what you're having here is people coming in with chest pain, their shorter breath, palpitations. Our guy could have had cardiogenic shock if we didn't look at the imaging. Um, and essentially you wanna get an ECG, you wanna get cardiac monitoring, bedside echo, ultrasound, you have to rule out a lot of things. And our main approach is IV fluids, pressors, including inotropes here. And uh, based on the cause, we want specific treatment. So that could be reperfusion if you're thinking of an MI. It could be valvular surgery if that's really the cause. Um, because you're not getting outflow, maybe aortic stenosis or something like that. Um, and if it's an anti, um, if it's needs, if it's a rhythm that can be shocked or um, given rhythm control, uh, then you want to start that. So I won't go into too much more detail. I'll let the cardiologist handle that. Um, just some doses that I put over there. So levofed is obviously my go-to uh, for vasopressors. You know, you have your options as well. Dibutamine specifically is important um, in cardiogenic shock because it's, it's really your inotrope that's going to be helping pumping um, through. Um, so that's something to consider. Again, uh, just note for levofed, it's 2 to 20 mics per minute versus dibutamine, it's 2 to 20 mics per kilo per minute. Uh, and you're titrating to maintain a map of uh, 65 or more. And our last shock, the K that doesn't make sense for anaphylactic, okay? So um, this is again, warm shock. It is under distributive shock, which is you know on the same page as uh, sepsis, um, but we have a clear history here that they've had some weird new item or they've been exposed to something and they have 
symptoms that are different from sepsis, right? So these are people who um, are warm, flushed, they have um, hives. So what does that look like? Raised patches. So um, um, these hives usually migrate um, through different areas of the body. You can have angioedema. What is that? So swelling of the mouth inside. So look at inside the mouth. If, if there's swelling inside, that's a very um, high risk situation. Um, we look at respiratory symptoms. Are they wheezing? Are they short of breath? Um, GI symptoms. So nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and cardiovascular. So are they hypotensive? Are they tacky? Okay. Any two system involvement um, is what uh, by definition um, qualifies you for anaphylaxis. So um, usually anaphylaxis will present within 30 minutes to an hour. Um, and that's our usual uh, presentations. Some people though can have a second reaction um, days later. And so this can go anywhere from um, after that episode to up to six days later. So just something to be mindful of clinically. So for anaphylaxis, I really like this algorithm that I got in medical school um, from the University of Ottawa. Uh, it was part of the ACLS course there. And um, you know, you always want to start with your ABC approach. So I'm going to give you that on the left side and then on the right, you have your algorithm. So first I'm assessing if they have angioedema, I'm preparing to intubate, intubate, or if I can't, if it's all like swollen in there, then you might have to get some surgical airway precautions ready. Um, if they're having breathing issues, so wheezing, uh, you know, give them oxygen, see if they have history of asthma or something like that. Do they need puffers? Um, circulation one liter bolus, I, if I know it's anaphylaxis, that's going to be one of my first orders, right? So I'm going to get two large bore IVs. We have to get that one liter NS in, and then you reassess. So now, instead of looking on the left, I'm going to get you to look on the right on the algorithm. And so once we've done our ABC, we're now moving from C, which is um, the one liter bolus, and then we give epi. So epi, please don't confuse, and I know you guys are all residents, so you know. So it's one to 1,000 concentration. You want to give 0.3 to 0.5 um, milligrams. And this is really important because that's what you're going to start off with. Now, if someone is in shock for a while, you might want to give a drip. And in that case, you use the one to 10,000 concentration at your kind of recess vasopressor dosing so that's five to 15 mics per minute potentially, and you're titrating it to their vitals. Um, if they're on a beta blocker, this won't really work. And so you wanna give glucagon, so that's one milligram IV or IM. Um, and then you have your little cocktail, right? So my cocktail, again, it, it's the Benadryl 50, ranitidine 50, and the uh, solumedrol 125 uh, milligrams IV. I know there are some variations to that um, you could do uh, weight-based dosing for the solumedrol, but um, if it's an adult, a big person, I just kind of go with that. Um, and then you're reassessing, reassessing, reassessing. So if they're not responding to this, then you're going to give more epi. If they are, are still hypotensive, you're going to give them more fluids. And then you kind of follow that algorithm and really have very low threshold for um, that intubation, um, if they become unconscious, getting the vasopressor started, getting ICU involved. Okay, so now I'm gonna pass on the mic to Say. Can you hear me? Am I in? Yep, you're good. Okay, awesome. So let's talk about an approach to altered mental status. So what we're going to do now is we're going to, as quickly as we can, kind of go head to toe and bang out some quick emergency department approaches to common presentations that your patients are going to show up with. Um, there was a request from the chat just to kind of talk about how you would manage this patient coming into your emergency department with a worried wife, some tachycardia, and some hypotension. I would, uh, I would start by putting him in a place where I can quickly assess him with the appropriate people I need beside him. So as long as it's available, I go to the trauma room. I would bring in my my, um, 
my best nurses at that time because I'm going to want two large bore IVs. I'm going to want to pull labs quickly. And upon taking a history, I would get that urgent ECG and use my bedside ultrasound to kind of assess more for why he's presenting with shock. Um, there, the two big things I'd be looking for for him would be, does he have a pneumothorax? Um, and then are there signs of cardiac tamponade? And so since um, you can use your bedside ultrasound for assessment of a pericardial effusion, you would you would get that view, see the see the effusion, and then once you've got that uh, ECG on top of it, you're kind of given an impression that this is going to be a cardiac tamponade. You can always use your pulseless paradoxes to kind of try and rule that in as well. Um, but I think once you've got the the picture of the pericardial effusion and the swinging heart on its axis with ECG findings, I would just call cardiology and arrange for help um, because since the patient is still awake, not necessarily dying in front of you, but sick, um, they might potentially be able to do it more carefully than you would with an ED pericardiocentesis. <laughs> um, I think that's, uh, I would personally prefer not to do an ED pericardiocentesis unless the patient is like pericode in front of me. Okay, so moving forward with this talk, let's talk about an approach to altered mental status. So, um, Patients with altered mental status, you know, we like to typically think of them as that like comatose person found on a bus stop, but I think you have to remember that they can also simply just be confused. They can be agitated. So that patient who's kind of picking, can't sit still, is always coming up to ask you questions, but it's kind of repetitive, or the patient who's aggressive. So someone who's threatening, really worked up, that patient also has a, hopefully an altered mental status. They might just be a jerk, but I'm guessing that they might be sick instead. So when I'm seeing these patients, I, I, like any other sick patient, patient who has the risk of deteriorating in front of me, it's the same thing over and over again. You stabilize them if they need to be stabilized. You do an assessment, including your history and physical exams. You initiate a workup and then you attain your collateral history. Um, so sometimes um, the workup is going to be affected by the history you get in the physical exam findings you have in front of you. But basic lab work, looking for metabolic causes, looking for things like hypoglycemia, um, that's always going to be needed in these patients. And then patients with altered mental status can't give their own history. And so if they come in without a loved one or someone who knows them well, you might have to send your medical student off on the phone to try and get that collateral history that helps you better understand what their baseline level of function is so you can see how they're different in the way they're acting now. Um, my differential diagnosis, I keep it simple. I go back to med school DIMS. So D stands for drugs, and in that I, I include toxins and withdrawal. We know that withdrawal can be deadly, so keep it on your differential diagnosis. Um, I stands for infection. So is this just overwhelming sepsis? Do they have a brain abscess, meningitis, or an encephalitis? Um, is this COVID-19? And they're simply presenting with altered level of consciousness. I know this talk isn't focused on COVID-19, but I am getting reports from the community hospitals and the tertiary hospitals that patients are just coming in altered, and then they find out that it's actually COVID-19 and it's just their surge response. And then inflammatory causes. I mean, we all want to catch that like crazy vasculitis, but there are other reasons that they might be altered as well. Metabolic causes. Here's where I rule out all of my um, electrolyte abnormalities, sodiums, calciums, and then of course your glucose. Think of other things more down the line like TSH, adrenal crisis, etc. And then your structural lesions, which these are things that you're going to need to get imaging for. Um, a quick, quick approach to bang out um, as soon as you meet a patient who's significantly altered is to check for your H's. Are they hypoxic? Are they hypercapnic? Are they hypoglycemic? Or are they hypotensive? All four of those can cause a patient to become either stuporous or agitated and aggressive, and it's worthwhile to knock all of those things off your list quickly. Um, so thinking about causes of altered mental status, I always come back to toxicology. Now, here's my... Um, Disclaimer, I'm doing peds emerge and my co-resident Riley Hartman from Saskatchewan is doing toxicology. So I don't study tox because I can trust him to always answer my text messages pretty much at any hour of the night and day. So my approach to tox is pretty simple. I think about what is the toxidrome I'm seeing in front of me. And this is a really nice and easily Googleable um, approach to seeing causes that might be leading to a uh, toxidrome. So are they hot? Are they altered? Are they hypertensive? Are they tachycardic? Well, then you're thinking anticholinergic or sympathomimetic. Is the patient depressed? Decreased heart rate? Are they not, um, are they colder? Are their pupils tiny? Are they no longer making bowel sounds? Well, then think about your, um, your sedative hypnotic or your opioid type uh, uh, toxidromes. 
And then my approach to a toxicologic workup is, is A, B, C, D, E, F, because I'm just an eMERGE doc and I don't know any other letters past that, um, with a little bit of a change to what you would see from your, your typical trauma workup. So airway, breathing, circulation, disability, all that's important. In your disability here, the two big things I would focus on would be making sure you know your glucose because a lot of toxidomes come with hypo or hyperglycemia. And then the other one is, is to ask yourself, are, are they altered because they're a non-clinical status epilepticus? So look for signs of like, um, potential like um, uh, like lip smacking, um, oral automatisms is the fancy word, um, really dilated pupils, things like that, or history that they might have had seizure activity earlier and now it's stopped, but they're still not waking up like normal. And then the DEF of toxicology is to decontaminate, eliminate, and find an antidote. Mm -hmm. Um, so when I think about decontamination, we usually think about activated charcoal. Um, previously, people had used things like gastric lavage to help with decontamination, unless the medication is very tiny and so can actually be pulled up by the tube, or if it's like incredibly toxic, so something like like massive TCA or massive colchicine overdose, and you need to get that medication out of their system, gastric lavage typically is not indicated. Um, however, activated charcoal is activated or is indicated. Things that you don't use it for would be your FAILS acronym, so pesticides, hydrocarbons, acids, alkalis, alcohols, iron, lithium, and solvents. The other thing you have to remember is that charcoal can be extremely irritating to the lung parenchyma. And so if your patient can't protect their airway and they're at risk of vomiting and aspirating, do not give them charcoal. If they really need that charcoal because what they've taken is very toxic and you just really want to decrease the load that they're having, intubate them for a projected clinical course and securing that airway so they don't aspirate the charcoal. Um, elimination comes down to two different versions. There's whole bowel irrigation, and this is directed by your toxicologic specialist. Basically what it is, is you um, usually intubate the patient, throw an NG down their nose, and give them like nonstop amounts of PEG so that they eliminate all the toxin as quickly as they possibly can. This usually involves a, um, a rectal uh, fecal management system because it gets really um, mucousy as the treatment takes effect. Um, the other version of elimination includes dialysis. Now, not all toxicologic insults are amenable to dialysis. So the, the, the toxicologic agent has to have low molecular weight, low protein binding, um, high volume of distribution in water and not fat, and then it has to have slow serum elimination anyways, because if the body is going to quickly eliminate the toxin by itself, adding dialysis is not gonna bring a lot of great additional effect. Um, I listed some medications that are pretty amenable to dialysis on the list on the on this slide. There are some additional ones you can consider, but these are pretty much the basics. Um, the other version of elimination includes like multi-dose activated charcoal. Again, this is something that is um, directed by your toxicologic specialists. And then the last thing you can do is F, find the antidote. There are lots of fun antidotes for lots of different kinds of um, toxicologic agents. There are a couple things you really want to consider before you start searching for an antidote. Is first of all, um, is there actually an antidote for the toxic agent? Um, will the antidote cause more toxicity than the actual agent itself? Um, is the toxic agent an unamenable to basic supportive management. So if we just try to support the patient through this, will it be effective or do we actually need to find an antidote? Um, if the patient cannot be appropriately decontaminated before the toxicologic agent is absorbed, then you might want to consider an antidote. And then um, if, the, if the toxicologic agent can't be er, have enhanced elimination, then you might want an antidote there. There are lots of different antidotes. What I've done in the slides here is I've put like a bunch of information underneath the slide in my speaker's notes, which I don't have access to right now while I'm Zooming. Um, but if there are additional um, antidotes that you wanna look up, there's a quick re reference for you there. Some of the ones that we know kind of right off the top of our tongue would be like, for example, toxic alcohols, methanol and ethylene glycol, you would use femepazole. For opioid overdoses, we use Narcan. And then other ones that can be quite life-threatening, which are important to know your antidotes for, would be um, beta blockers. So there you would use high-dose insulin, calcium channel blockers, you would give IV calcium, and then you can also use high-dose insulin in that instance. Um, local anesthetic overdose, you would consider intralipid. Cyanide overdose, for example, in house fires, you would use your hydroxycholine, mm, that word, um, sodium theosulfate and sodium nitrate, digoxin, digiband, 
um, Tylenol, MAC, and uh, sodium channel blockers and tricyclics both need sodium bicarb. The last thing I'm going to remind you is that TOX is a two-year fellowship all on its own. They do so much pharmacology and they do so much focus on like pathophysiology and metabolic pathways that you really want to involve them as your friend early in a TOX case. They're going to help direct your management. They're going to give you a predicted course for the clinical presentation of your patient and whether or not they're going to need to go to ICU. And they're going to follow up on that patient for you so that as the patient transitions from eMERGE to ICU to the general ward to home, we know that they're getting consistent care um, focused exactly on their toxicologic insult. Um, these are the only two tox groups I know of, but I'm sure that different provinces across the country have their specific ones they would be calling. So the other one that I'm going to touch very briefly on for altered mental status would be your structural lesions because it lends itself to a really nice um, visual round. So you guys can put it in the chat. I'll give you a second. Have a look at this picture. Tell me what your diagnosis is. Um, I'll give you a hint, this patient presented, he's 31 years old, had a bar fight, came in aggressive, and within an hour was almost comatose. So that would be a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, the next patient we're going to have here comes in 56 years old on anticoagulation, was also in a bar fat fight. Um, this is actually a patient of mine who presented, first of all, quite flirtatious but confused, got agitated, couldn't sit still, was like standing up, walking around, refused to stay in his bed, and then got agitated to the point he was swinging at my nurses, and then got comatose. And he had a wicked subdural hemorrhage. Um, the difference between these two, kind of trying to capture it here, your epidural bleed is arterial, so it's coming out fast, and that's why you see this like walking, talking patient that shows up to your emergency department and then dies in front of you within four hours. Um, here, you're going to have this uh, concave, convex, convex bleeding, so it'll push into the brain matter, and, um, and it'll be stuck between your suture lines. To contrast, your subdural bleed is going to be venous. It's going to kind of slide in and around the brain, so you're not going to have that protrusion into the brain matter unless it's significant, and um, usually this is a slower bleed, and sometimes you'll have a grandma or a grandpa who comes into your emergency department, which is like this confusion that's kind of been grumbling along for a couple weeks. You'll do the CT scan. You'll see this chronic subdural that's been there for a while, and just because their atrophied brains can kind of adjust to the extra volume, they only present with this mild confusion. And then the other patient that we should probably talk about here is your patient who presents with a, the case is 43-year-old female who syncopizes in front of her husband while they're doing a uh, CrossFit workout of the day, now is complaining of the worst headache of her life that had 10 to the 10 onset at the very beginning and lots of neck stiffness, so much so that she can't flex her neck. I'm sure you're going with what I'm saying here. This is going to be a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, um, emergency medicine has to always rationalize why they're ordering imaging. Um, our radiology co colleagues are very good at making sure we're not wasting health resources here. So you can use the Ottawa subarachnoid hemorrhage of, um, evaluation tool to kind of get an understanding about um, what the potential risk for your patient is for having a subarachnoid. If they answer yes to any of these instances and they've had this very severe headache that peaks within an hour, is different than any prior headache, um, then you have about a 100% sensitivity and 15% specificity to catching a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, if, of course, your patient doesn't have any of these but you still have that high risk, you're not wrong to do further investigations. The goal is to get a CT head for subarachnoid hemorrhage within the first six hours of presentation. If you're outside that window, you might not see the blood um, pooling. And in that case, you might need to consider doing an LP and looking for xanchrothomia. Zancro you know what I'm saying. And then another rule that we really use quite heavily in the emergency department I'm is- sorry, I'm just gonna interrupt for one second here. What's up? The first intracranial bleed, uh, the chat is asking, the first one was a subarachnoid or an epidural? Epidural. Epidural, right? Okay. Yeah, it was, had, it was pushing into the brain. Back. It had that curvy appearance, um, and it was stuck between two suture lines. It was an epidural. Thank you. Anything else? No, I think we're good. You can continue. Um, so another rule that eMERGE docs love to use, especially in Canada, is the Canadian CT head rule. This kind of lets you recognize in a minor head injury, does my patient need imaging? So this does not include a minimal head injury where the patient has no loss of consciousness, 
no change in the GCS, no amnesia, and no neurologic deficits. In those minimal head injuries, you don't really need to do a CT head. The risk of them having a bleed was found to be 1.4%, um, and that's for like a minor intracranial hemorrhage that did not require neurosurgical intervention. However, if your patient has a minor head injury, so that's when they have a witness loss of consciousness, GCS 13 to 15, witness disorientation or amnesia or neurologic deficit, well then you can use this rule to determine whether or not your patient needs to get a CT head. This rule is completely out the window, in my opinion, if your patient is anticoagulated. We know that anticoagulated patients can have brain bleeds if they sneeze too hard, and I'm not kidding, this can happen. So for patients with a minimal head injury who are anticoagulated, 4.8% um, of them had an intracranial hemorrhage. And for those who had a minor head injury, so any of the loss of consciousness, definite amnesia, witness disorientation, or GCS 13 to 15, they had an intracranial hemorrhage rate of 21.9%. So now let's blitz through chest pain. Um, chest pain, like in, in everything emergency medicine, you have to have an approach. And I think an approach usually starts the moment you pick up a chart and you see that someone's come in with a specific complaint, so chest pain. I like to start by just running a differential through my head about all the things that could possibly kill them and all the things that it might otherwise be. And when it comes to chest pain, lots of things can kill you. So without even touching on COVID-19, we know that chest pain can include multiple different cardiac regions. So acute coronary syndrome, pericarditis, cardiac tamponade, val uh, valvular disease, myocarditis, et cetera, et cetera. Pulmonary regions that cause chest pain include PE, pneumonia, pleurisy, um, pneumothorax, tension pneumothorax, Vascular reasons include the terrifying aortic dissection. Gastrointestinal reasons can be things as simple as GERD, but you might also see peptic ulcer disease, pancreatitis, esophageal rupture, and even sometimes the right upper quadrant pathology associated with the gallbladder can cause chest pain. Your musculoskeletal um, causes of chest pain can include things like chest trauma, fractured ribs, pulled muscles, costochondritis, and then always look at the skin because they might just have herpes zoster causing their pain. And then your mental health reasons. Um, I, I always say that diagnosing anxiety as the cause of chest pain is a, diff is a diagnosis of exclusion, um, but it, it can be the cause of chest pain in some instances as well. So to quickly run through ACS, I want to start by saying I think of acute coronary syndromes as a spectrum. And so you would start with your stable angina, then you have your unstable angina, and STEMI, and STEMI. And at any point along that spectrum, the patient can skip steps and go from having just like stable angina or no angina at all to actually having a STEMI. But if you think of it as a spectrum, you can kind of walk through what's happening at the heart and then therefore what you need to do to manage the patient. So hopefully all of your STEMIs come into the emergency department, clutching their chest, complaining of this heavy chest pain that's radiating into their arm and up into their jaw, associated with sweating and shortness of breath and vomiting. But that might not always be the case. We have to remember that some of our patients, especially our female and our diabetic patients, um, are gonna present atypically. And that's where the vomiting, the sweatiness, just feeling weak might actually be your more common presentations. When you're looking at your typical STEMI evolution, it's going to start with these like peaked T's. And it's really interesting. If a patient comes into your emergency department with EMS quickly from their home complaining of that really heavy 10 out of 10 chest pain, do serial ECGs and you'll see this evolution. You'll see these peaking T's. Then you're going to start to see these like small monophasic ST elevation areas that get bigger. You'll see your, your T waves inverting. And then later on, you'll eventually see your Q, Q waves a couple days after the injury and the insult. Remember that the different areas of the ECG affected correlate to different areas of anatomic injury. And so, for example, your inferior um, myocardial infarction of the right coronary artery is typically associated with ST elevation and leads to 3 and ABF. And then always look for the reciprocal changes as well because that really helps hammer home the diagnosis of, yes, this is the STEMI. All of these slides are going to be available later, so don't worry about like trying to take screenshots or memorize them or anything like that. This kind of goes back to that idea that ACS is on a spectrum. So you have a normal artery, and then as we all get older, we all throw some plaque onto our arteries. If the plaque is growing stably without any rupture, then you start to have fixed stable angina. So after doing a specific amount of, of exertion, then you start to have your anginal chest pain. If your plaque ruptures and blows and blocks the whole artery, then you get an acute MI. Squeaking a little bit of blood through lets it become an end STEMI. If there's no flow through, that's when you start to see full myocardial infarction, and that's where you get your STEMI.
And then unstable angina happens in two ways. One, you can get a little bit of a plaque rupture, or two, the burden of the clot buildup actually just gets so high that the amount of, um, of blood flowing through the arteries is no longer enough to perfuse at uh, a much lower threshold than when they have their stable angina. So it, again here, kind of working on that spectrum, you can see that for a STEMI, you're gonna have that persistent ST elevation and your treatment there is really to decrease the clot burden as quickly as you can, either with a PCI reperfusion or a fibrinolytic. If you have ST abnormalities and a positive troponin, then you're thinking your patient's more high risk, you would classify them as an end STEMI and they would require inpatient management. Um, sometimes with reperfusion management strategies, for example, PCI later on, or um, a cabbage surgery, but these patients don't actually benefit from fibrolinic therapy unless they're having that staggering chest pain that's just very persistent and won't go away. And then the other kind of patient, which is the scariest patient for an eMERGE doc because choosing about their disposition is the hardest part, is that patient who's got like a typical chest pain history, a normal ECG, and normal tropes. And the question is, is what are you gonna do with them? Before we worry about those patients, I've created two slides that kind of talk about how you manage a STEMI and how you manage an end STEMI slash unstable angina. Now, I don't want to go into all the meds and all the doses. Um, my references have always just been using up to date and their drug dosing uh, reference uh, library. Um, but it's nice to just have a quick approach. So the first thing you want to do for your patients is manage their pain. As long as you're not worried about them being preload dependent with a right-sided or right-sided posterior heart attack, then you can consider using nitrates. Opioids are effective in managing pain, but they have been associated with some higher mortality, so use them judiciously. And then in your STEMI, you need to relieve that clot burden. So if your patient is able to get to PCI within 90 minutes or with travel 120 minutes, then get them to PCI. If not, then get them their fibr fibrinolytic within the 30 minute mark. Add your antiplatelet therapy, anticoagulate them, and then as they stabilize, add your statin, your beta blocker, your ACE inhibitor, and continue to use your dual antiplatelet therapy. For your end STEMIs here, the big change is that they don't need to have that immediate reperfusion therapy. They can have a delayed PCI. They don't need a fibrinolytic. And sometimes these patients are better suited for a cabbage after you get their angiogram done. So you can kind of build that management appropriately with your cardiology team. These typically aren't decisions that are happening in the emergency department. And so I haven't even gone into that process there. And then the last thing that the eMERGE doc needs to ask himself is, who can go home? And I think that... Sick patients are easy in emergency medicine because their disposition is clear. They're coming in, they're gonna have more specialists taking care of them and providing them the services that they need. Healthy patients who have like a concerning presentation, they're the scary ones because they might go home and they might die and you'll never know. And, and you just don't want that to happen to them. So the, the, the chest pain patient who comes in, but isn't an end STEMI, isn't a STEMI, isn't even true unstable angina, you need to kind of figure out how you're gonna be able to assess the risk for acute coronary syndrome. And so eMERGE docs develop the heart score. And so what this is, is it's, you use these risk factors and history scores, an ECG, and then a troponin three hours after presentation. And you score them based on the items that are listed on the screen right now. If their score is three or less, they are very low risk for cardiac um, events or death. So the 30-day all-cause death and mortality or occurrence of a myocardial infarction is 0.4%. And it's not nothing, but it's pretty close. Um, and so that patient is usually safe for discharge home and actually doing any further investigations has been associated with harm and not actually preventing risk. For patients who have a score that's higher than three, then it's time to really start thinking about doing additional investigation. So are they amenable to doing a, a stress test on the treadmill? Do they need a MIBI, et cetera? At any point in there, if your patient's ECG changes and you're seeing signs of an end STEMI or a STEMI, or if you're getting positive tropes back, well, then it's time to really reevaluate where you're going with this patient and ask yourself, wait, is this actually an end STEMI? Is this actually unstable angina? And involve your cardiologist there. So here's another ECG here. I'll give you a moment to kind of look at it and think about what you're seeing. Um, I'll give you a hint. It's not another MI. I hate repeating myself. <clears throat> and so what you might be seeing here is some widespread ST elevation and some widespread PR depression with reciprocal ST depression and PR elevation in V1 and AVR. So this kind of correlates nicely with a pericarditis. 
And so the other finding that you'll typically see on a pericarditis uh, ECG is just actually sinus tachycardia as well. And so we know that pericarditis kind of moves through uh, four different stages. And depending upon where you see them in their healing process, you'll get different stages of an ECG. So stage one is that widespread ST elevation and PR depression with reciprocal changes in AVR and V1. Stage two, you see some normalization of your ST elevation and your T waves flatten out. Stage three, you start to see T wave inversion. And then stage four, your ECG normalizes again. Often pericarditis can be associated with a myocarditis, and that's where your use of uh, CHOPE and CK can be helpful because that actually shows sign of myocardial muscle damage. And then pericarditis can also be seen to have a pericardial effusion. So it's usually worthwhile to get imaging of these patients, either bedside or formal echo, to make sure that it's not so significant that they're at risk for cardiac tamponade. Um, pericarditis can be caused by a lot of things. It can be um, random, or it can be infectious, immunological, secondary to an MI, due to uremia, due to trauma, a perineal plastic syndrome due to drugs, or even after radiation therapy. So just uh, keep it on your back of your head, but that's, that's part of the differential when it comes to chest pain, especially sharp chest pain. Um, again, here, the decision about whether or not your patient can stay or can go. These are some risk factors that are associated with high-risk pericarditis. And if your patient has any of uh, a fever greater than 38, the subacute course, so kind of like gets worse slowly and slowly and slowly, any hemodynamic compromise suggesting cardiac tamponade. If the effusion is really large, you'll know it's large when you see it, if they're immunosuppressed, if they're at high risk for bleeding, if they've recently had trauma, or if they have that elevated troponin suggestive of a myocarditis and, and um, cardiac muscle damage, then I would admit them to hospital for further diagnostic evaluation and treatment. Either way, treatment includes NSAIDs, colchicine, and, redic and restriction from strenuous activity. So then the other thing that can cause chest pain, of course, is a pulmonary embolus. Here in front of you, you see the lovely Verco's triad, which involves stasis, endothelial injury, and hypercoagulability. When you think about those three cases, then you really kind of work through your differential diagnosis of things that might be causing a VTE. And so any patient who has, for example, malignancy would be higher risk, and you'd be binging off in the back of your head that you should think about asking the questions regarding PE more and more. Um, PE itself has three areas of pathophysiology. So the first part is infarction, and that's where the clot actually causes parts of the lung tissue to necrose. And this is where you actually get hemoptysis, typically only seen in about 10% of patients, but it is significant injury um, when you do get the in true infarction of the, of the lung tissue. The next part you see is that abnormal gas exchange. Um, and, and this is when we start to see this change in your ventilation, or ventilation and perfusion ratios. And then the last thing we'll see is your cardiovascular compromise. So here you have decreased blood pressure because you have decreased stroke volume and decreased cardiac output. And part of this is due to this high PVR that's coming from the physical restriction of the, of the vascular beds due to thrombus and hypoxic obstruction. And then with your high PVR, you get decreased right ventricular outflow, and your RV starts to dilate, and it blows into your intraventricular septum, decreasing the amount that your LV is actually able to fill, which decreases your overall cardiac output. <clears throat> Signs and symptoms of a PE, pleuritic chest pain, dyspnea, cough, hemoptysis, DVT symptoms, syncope, shock, have it at the top of your head. We're learning more and more as we do imaging for other reasons that a lot of patients are walking around with low risk subsegmental PEs. Um, and so if a patient comes in with pleuritic chest pain, ask yourself, should I be thinking about working them up for PE? The answer is probably yes. Um, when it comes to PE, there are three different levels of PE. So the first would be your massive high-risk PE, and these are patients who have hemodynamic compromise. So hypotension of less than 90 millimeters uh, mercury or less than 40 of their normal that lasts more than 15 minutes despite appropriate fluid resuscitation and the patients requiring pressors. That is considered a high-risk PE. Your submassive PEs have signs of hemodynamic compromise on their echo. So their RV is bowing, they've got a McConnell sign, things don't look great, but the patient's still able to appropriately compensate with their blood pressure. And for these patients, there's quite a spectrum. This includes the patient who is fluid responsive despite being initially hypotensive. And then the last kind of patient has a PE, but has no signs of hemodynamic compromise on their, on their echo. Now working up a PE is the eMERGE docs like it's a, it's a wheelhouse cornerstone thing that you need to know how to do. So if you think your patient might have a PE before you order any investigations, before you enter any blood work or imaging, I suggest you start by doing the well score. So go to your MD calc and calculate your well score. 
Now, if your well score is less than two, they're pretty low risk. So then you calculate another score. You ask yourself, are they PERC positive? If your patient has any of the following, that's a yes, well, then they're PERC positive and you're going to have to get a D-dimer. But if they're no for all of the questions listed here, then they're PERC negative and PE is actually excluded. So now your well score is less than two and they're PERC positive, or their well score is between two to six, well, then it's time to get a D-dimer. If the D-dimer is less than 500, P is excluded. Don't even worry about it. But if the D-dimer is greater than 500, then you need to do imaging. Typically, CTPE is your like first line for imaging, but that changes if your patient's pregnant, is high risk, has renal dysfunction, et cetera, et cetera. I'll kind of talk about pregnant patients a little bit towards the end because they're, they're a high risk group that I don't want us to forget about. And then of course, if your well score is greater than six or your D-dimer is greater than 500, then you have to get that imaging, okay? In my opinion, CTPE is better than a VQ perfusion scan, which is usually better than bilateral lower extremity Doppler ultrasound for DVT. In your pregnant patient, there's this new score that was released in October of 2018 that can help rule out patients who don't have um, PE and don't need to get a CT. And so these patients, you use the years criteria to assess them. So the years criteria is three things. It's clinical signs of DVT, any history of hemoptysis, or PE is the most likely diagnosis, which really gives you as a clinician the chance to have your Deschalt jump to the front. And then, um, and then you get a D-dimer. If the D-dimer is less than 1,000, then the patient does not have a PE and they do not need to get any um, treatment or any imaging. If, the, if they have no years criteria and their D-dimer is greater than 1,000, then you should do imaging. And if they have at least one of the three years criteria and their D-dimer is less than 500, then you're still safe because that low D-dimer really helps rule out PE. But if they have one, at least one of the years criteria and a D-dimer that's greater than 500, they're still going to need that imaging. Okay. And this is kind of like the breakdown from the article that was actually published. Here again in Saskatoon, this is kind of our approach to imaging in the pregnant patient. We like to start with bilateral compression of the ultrasound or bilateral compression ultrasound of the legs looking for DVT. If it's positive for DVT, then you just treat it as a PE. If it's negative for DVT, then you have to go to further scanning. And in our department, they prefer to do CTPAs, but it changes um, depending upon where you're practicing emergency medicine. Um, there are some signs on x-ray for PE. So on right here, you have Hampton's hump and Hampton's hump is 22% specific to lung infarction, which is of course what's happening with a PE. And then you have Westermark sign, which is 14% sensitive, but 92% specific. And it involves dilation of pulmonary arteries proximal to the embolism with collapse of the distal vessels later on. To manage a PE, you, you go back to that classification. Is my patient hemodynamically stable or are they unstable? If they're stable, you give them oxygen as needed, you get IV access in case they get sicker in front of you, and then you start empiric anticoagulation. And I have a slide on that following this. If they're hemodynamically unstable, you resuscitate, you initiate immediate anticoagulation, and then you consider thrombolytic. So empiric anticoagulation in a stable patient is, um, it's not an IV infusion. You can use anoxaparin, daltaparin, or tinsaparin um, to start off in the hospital. There is, um, yeah. And then um, if they're unstable, then you would give the infusion of unfractionated heparin. So you give them the bolus followed by the, the infusion dose there. And then if your patient's really unstable, you can consider giving a fibrinolytic. Now, most um, centers have like a, a PE fibrinolytic team that can be kind of activated, whether or not it's just your ICU or if it involves ICU and pulmonary and vascular altogether. And they can kind of judge whether or not the patient needs to have the fibrinolytic. However, in the acutely crashing patient who is pericode with a great echo at the bedside suggestive of PE, you might want to start giving the fibrinolytic early. There are multiple different ways to give the fibrinolytic. There's really no evidence about which is the best way to do it. Although there is some growing body of evidence that's saying smaller doses are as effective as the big doses. Typically, my approach is that a dead patient stays dead unless you fix it. So I would typically bolus more faster. So I would be more inclined to do the 100 milligrams quickly or the 20 milligram bolus with then a, a nice infusion afterwards. Um, but here is kind of center to center and practitioner to practitioner dependent. So another type of deadly chest pain, of course, is the pneumothorax, pleuritic chest pain, dyspnea, decreased air entry, subcutaneous emphysema, really easy to diagnose with bedside ultrasound. Um, and it's definitely something you can look up quickly if you, if you want to kind of get familiar with what it looks like. Here, your management is oxygen therapy, chest tube drainage. I think if you click on this um, 
chest x-ray later on in the slide, it takes you right to the link to put in a chest tube as well. Tension pneumothorax is a little bit scarier. Here you have the clinical triad of a deviated trachea away from the affected side, jugular venous distension, and decreased air entry on the affected side. Here your patient needs urgent management. It's a clinical diagnosis. So if you're making this diagnosis in the CT scanner, your patient's probably dead. Um, and once they become hypotensive with the, with the known pneumothorax, you're gonna need to decompress that chest, chest urgently. We're finding more and more, especially as our patients get more and more obese, that a needle decompression isn't sufficient. And so typically you need to go to a finger thoracostomy or urgent chest tube placement. This patient's a little bit different. I'll give you guys a second to look at the chest x-ray and kind of think about what you're seeing here. Now, if you're looking closely along, you're gonna see that there's this like black line that's kind of highlighting the heart here. And then up here, you're seeing signs of subcutaneous emphysema. And this is just a pneumomediastinum. So it's just something to be looking for and thinking about if your patient's complaining of like pleuritic chest pain and that like rice crispy feeling in their neck. Next, but definitely not least, is the deadly aortic dissection. Typically these patients have like an inciting agent, so whether or not it's chronic hypertension, weakened vascular wall due to a genetic disease such as Ehlers-Danlos, aneurysm, or a traumatic cause, patients here really present with this sharp tearing pain. 90% of patients have uh, pain and 85% of them describe it as sharp. Pulse deficit means a difference of 20 millimeters of mercury between the two limbs, um, but if you're palpating a pulse deficit, then that's pretty sensitive. Um, these patients can also present with stroke syndromes because of the dissection actually blowing off the arteries that are attached to it. So radiating up into the neck, they can present with like facial droop, weakness, et cetera. Um, and then other patients can present with limb ischemia as well. <clears throat> there are the two types. Type A involves the aortic arch at any point along the tract, and type B does not involve the aortic arch. Type A are usually surgically managed as long as the patient doesn't have a lot of additional risk factors. Type B is up to the surgeon to decide. Um, but here in the emergency department, your job is to manage their pain, decrease their impulse therapy, so decrease their blood pressure and decrease their heart rate because every time the heart beats, it shears the vasculature and the higher the pressure, the greater the shear force. And then consult surgery for whether or not they're going to manage this patient with an intervention. Your anti-impulse therapy is listed here. I typically start with one of my um, uh, beta blockers. I like labetalol because my ED nurses are used to using it. And then if I'm not achieving the, um, the change in blood pressure and heart rate that I want to see, then I'll use a vasodilator. But these patients are typically pretty sensitive to vasodilators, so I always start small and then slowly titrate up. Um, this slide has like dosing, contraindications, and things like that at the bottom once you have access to the PowerPoint. And then my last deadly chest pain is the ruptured esophagus. Um, the only reason I added this is because my mother-in-law had this happen to her and that was kind of scary. So here you're having this like patient who's retching, 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 and then they rupture their esophagus. The full rupture of all three um, layers of the esophagus is Borhoff syndrome, which was actually first described in a pirate who had returned from um, uh, being at to sea and partied a little too hard and then puked so hard he died and then someone cut him open and was like oh yes his, his esophagus ruptured and then Mallory Weiss is just a partial tear of the two inner layers of the, the esophagus. Um, here your gold standard imaging will be CT have a high index of suspicion because these can be missed and then your goal is to just avoid all oral intake support them with um, uh, TPN start your broad spectrum antibiotics early and consult surgery for definitive management. That takes me to abdomen pain. I'm going to stop sharing here, and Tenzilla, you're up. All right. Okay, I'm going to get everyone to just stretch your arms, do a quick little stretch while I get this sorted. Um, this is a long lecture and we apologize, but Emerge is literally everything. So not much we can do. All right, so moving on to abdominal pain. Okay, can everyone see my screen, I think? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, so much like real estate, abdominal pain is all dependent on location, location, location. 
So our abdomen is home to a bunch of different organs. And um, if you are not from eMERGE, then you are now being introduced to one of the most common approaches to emergency medicine, and that's Hickam's dictum. So patients can have as many diseases as they damn well please. And so uh, one of the questions that people had were, you know, the guy with the tamponade, are we worried about a viral infection or something? And yes, we are. You know, he had a fever, he had a cough, shortness of breath, and he doesn't just have one thing. He can have as many conditions as he possibly wants or ends up with. Um, so with abdominal pain, it can be so broad. And so let's kind of break it down. So I'm seeing the patient, I'm looking at the vitals, heart rate's up. Now that could be from pain, that could be from shock. Temperature can be from inflammatory process or an infection. Oxygen being down, you know, is there something else going on? Um, are their vitals stable or unstable? So that's your first thing to figure out. Next, we're moving on to um, our um, appearance. And so, you know, is the person scrouched, like slouched uh, over, crunch, um, like holding onto their stomach or are they lying flat, walking, no issues? Is there peritonitis when you're examining them? Are they having um, any other difficulties? Are they writhing and things like that? Um, and when you get to your abdominal exam, I just really want to stress the importance of not forgetting your respiratory system, your cardiac system, your gynae, GU system. So assess for that torsion, assess for um, other infections that can all be contributing to this or be involved with it. So my general approach to abdominal pain involves my abdominal panel. So I just checked that little box on uh, our eMERGE uh, Rex. Um, but you know, what does that mean? So again, your undifferentiated abdominal pain should really be investigated thoroughly. So I'm talking CBC, LFTs, lipase, um, again, location dependent things that could uh, change how you do things um, include, you know, I, I'm still, I still might do an ECG and a trope if I'm having a patient with epigastric pain and has the right risk factors. Um, if they have um, epigastric pain, I'm going to add lipase. If they're a woman, I'm going to add that beta HCG. And so, you know, you really want to be um, specific and yet broad, and that balance is going to be your clinical exam. So general investigations, um, this includes abdo x-ray, chest x-ray, bedside ultrasound, you know, is that a rupture of triple A? Do we have an intrauterine pregnancy or do I have to rule out an ectopic with a more formal ultrasound? Um, something that, you know, can happen if you're new to the eMERGE, you may write abdominal ultrasound and you forgot to write pelvic and you actually, in the back of your mind, were thinking, you know, could this be a ruptured cyst or torsion or something? Um, you know, if you don't write pelvic with that, they probably won't do it. So definitely include that um, if you're worried about it. Um, and so I'll leave this list. Again, you'll have the slides later. So moving on to the next. So my general approach is really CABC. So usually with abdo pain, their vitals are a little bit off if um, they're coming acutely ill. And so, you know, I, I do start with my circulation first um, because usually they're not having that respiratory distress, but if they do, I'm going to check their airway, make sure it's patent, make sure they're alert, um, make sure that they're breathing okay, as, I've, uh, as we'll see, you know, um, certain abdo concerns can lead to respiratory concerns subsequently. So um, then we move on back to our C's and then, you know, you can continue giving your um, IV, anti uh, IV fluids. Symptom management is key, so get that pain control right away. One of the things that I really want to stress about emergency medicine is people come with pain, and sometimes we forget um, and we undermanage that part. And so, you know, Tylenol, Toradol, I try non-opioids first, but then um, if I want um, IV meds, I'm going to add the morphine or even oral morphine, depending on, again, what uh, I'm thinking might be the cause. Something to know with Toradol, and I'm, getting, I'm guessing we're going to have questions on this. You know, there's a question of, 10 uh, milligrams or 30 milligrams. Well, I go with 15 because it's easy for the nurses to draw up. Um, but otherwise, you know, there has been some studies to show that uh, 10 milligrams is sufficient and anything more than that, you're just getting the side effects without much more pain control. Um, some people uh, don't really agree with that. So, I'm, you know, it's kind of, I'll, I'll let you guys do more research on it. So mine is just that middle ground 15. Um, and your antiemetics are also important if they're nauseous common antibiotics, and this is not um, the end-all be-all, but this is the one that I've seen GenSurge always ask me for, 
air is going to be um, flagell, so metronidazole, to cover your anaerobes, and cipro or ceftriaxone um, to cover your Gram negatives. So that's kind of the main approach. And if they're septic, then I want more broad coverage. So I'm going to add that piptazo on there. And they're NPO until you know what's going on. A really common thing that we'll start with is um, biliary colic or acute coli. Um, and so this is someone coming in with right upper quadrant pain. Um, this might be colicky coming and going. They might be febrile. They might have a positive Murphy. So, you know, it's, it's a whole spectrum of how unwell they present. Um, I'm going to be doing my ab, uh, abdo panel with chemistry and whatnot, but what I'm looking at is for an elevation in the white count, if I'm thinking of an infection. I'm looking for ALP GGT. If those are up, then I'm more suspicious of some sort of a stone uh, causing an obstructive uh, pattern. And uh, I need that ultrasound. That ultrasound is going to tell me, is this just a stone that's flopping around, causing pain intermittently? You know, we don't need to really worry as much. Or is this something that's like, oh shoot, they have acute uh, cholecystitis or um, they have obstruction or not. And so ultrasound is um, your first line. Um, so based on our diagnosis with our presentation and workup, we're going to either say this is biliary colic, which means normal vitals. Um, ultrasound just shows a stone and the labs are okay and the pain comes and goes, they're just like attacks. What do you do? Well, I just refer them to outpatient uh, general surgery in that case. They can talk to the surgeon. Some people don't want surgery, some people want it, um, but, it, but they, they do uh, get a consult at that point. Um, and I give them supportive therapy, tell them what the red flags are to come back in case they have an acute cholecystitis. So for acute cholecystitis, um, you know, we're wondering about um, infection and whatnot. And so first thing I'm going to do is get the general surgeon on the line, um, get them ready for admission, keep the patient NPO, give your fluids the usual recess amounts and the common antibiotics I've listed here. But um, again, it depends on your local area. Next, moving a little bit to the left, we have pancreatitis. <laughs> Uh, and so this is someone coming in with epigastric pain, sometimes radiates to the back, um, and they can come with nausea, vomiting, fever. Again, like I said, this is not the only thing that they could present with, so your differential needs to stay broad. Um, but for pancreatitis specifically, they might have um, things that we worry about, uh, which include Gray Turner and Cullen sign. So what these are is bruising that you see on either the two flanks uh, on the sides or around the umbilicus, and those show signs of retroperitoneal or intra-abdominal hemorrhage, which um, is a complication of pancreatitis. So we really need to be careful. And pancreatitis can precipitate ARDS and hypoxemia. So again, keep that in the back of your mind. You know, in eMERGE, they might not just have one thing. Um, they could be related, unrelated, whatnot. So keep your... Um, uh, approach broad. To diagnose pancreatitis, you need um, two of the three criteria. So it should be characteristic abdominal pain or lipase three times upper limit of normal or characteristic findings on the CT or ultrasound. Usually ultrasound is your go-to because you want to rule out that biliary colic and whatnot, which can also come on with a similar presentation. Um, and so you start with that, but you know, if you're worried about other things, pancreatitis uh, might be seen on the CT as well. Management, so similar to the others, ABCs, um, you know, but if someone is very stable and they're able to tolerate food easily, um, their pain is better with oral um, uh, medications, they usually can be um, discharged and followed up with a family doctor or whatnot, more to kind of monitor um, their symptoms and uh, whatnot. If someone is unable to tolerate orally, then you need to admit them, keep them NPO and slowly, um, you know, resuscitate them, sorry, aggressively resuscitate them, but, you know, just monitor them and uh, give them supportive therapy. Antibiotics are only really needed if you have a clear source of infection. And so that could be like you're seeing abscess or necrosis on CT, you're seeing an affected pseudocyst, in which case gen surge is going to be involved. And uh, that's when I start my antibiotics. I don't just off the bat start it, um, but I think if I'm worried enough to get gen surge involved, I'm definitely going to start it. Um, in terms of gallstones, um, 
if you have gallstone pancreatitis, that definitely is um, an indication for Gen Surge Consult because they might want to do an ERCP at that point, uh, which is essentially they're going in and taking that stone out, which is precipitating the pancreatitis. Um, if uh, they might end up needing a cholecystectomy, in fact, they might have acute coli as well. Um, and if it's a cyst or an abscess, they might need drainage. Usually, you know, other causes of pancreatitis involve alcohol. It could be hypertriglyceridemia or idiopathic, meaning we just don't know. And so um, if they're pretty stable, you know, I'm giving them to the hospitalist or uh, internist, or I will pass them on to the ICU. So next one, let's uh, move on to a case. So I have a 70 year old guy from the nursing home coming in with some nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. It looks a little bit distended and, um, as most people from nursing homes and you know, elderly that we see, um, I'm concerned for his abdomen. And um, it, on that picture, you can see it looks a little bit distended. I don't know if it's just the covers, but I'm gonna say it's distended. So uh, I order an abdominal x-ray and this is kind of what I see. So this is him standing. And I'm guessing you guys pretty much all know what this looks like. And then, um, so I'm gonna have him lying down and I see a certain pattern. So I'm seeing these dilated uh, loops of bowel and I'm seeing plica circular. So it's, it's that um, you can see on the arrows, but this is a quite distended abdomen. This patient's not passing gas. They're not tolerating anything orally and their abdomen's distended. So I'm concerned for a bowel obstruction. In fact, in this one, it's a small bowel obstruction, which is the most common. Um, and so, you know, my workup includes my usual abdo panel, but I'm really worried about more like electrolyte imbalances potentially. Um, the x-ray is really diagnostic along with my history. Um, and I'm going to get Gen Surge. Um, I'm going to, oh, sorry, before I do that, I will definitely order that CT of the abdomen because I need to know what caused it or if this um, is something that could be surgically fixed. Um, so I'm going to keep them NPO, start my IV fluids. Um, if it's as it distended as that and they're really nauseous, I do get the nurse to put in an uh, NG tube to get um, some gastric decompression. And then um, Gen Surge Consult is really important. Next, um, we are now moving to appendicitis, which is super common. Um, but sometimes, even though we think it is appendicitis, it's not. So, you know, we really need to make sure we're looking broadly here. So patients usually come with periumbilical pain and then it goes right to the right lower quadrant. They're sometimes febrile, they're nauseous, maybe diarrhea. Um, and on exam, you know, they're usually like clenching, kind of uh, slouched over, um, having some painful uh, pain when walking and whatnot. Some people though look pretty well, except that um, grumbling pain in the right lower quadrant. And so my labs include my abdominal panel, but I need to rule out ectopic pregnancy. So if this is a woman, you're going to add that beta HCG, um, CRP and white count might be elevated. And um, I'm gonna get an ab abdominal ultrasound if my physical exam and my labs um, are suggestive of it. On uh, ultrasound, I'm not gonna go through the details of what that looks like. Um, you know, sometimes we get reports saying, appendix not visualized. So what do you do? Um, if the appendix is not visualized and you have a high suspicion, and one of the scores I like using is the Alvarado score. Um, you know, everyone who doesn't have MD calc on your phone, um, download that. All your scoring things are there. Um, but I, I like using that because that kind of brings in all my clinical findings into one, gives me my suspicion for appendicitis. And even if it's a young person at that point, um, I might you know, just order the CT. If it's an older person, CT like easily will be my go-to. Um, again, I just want to, you know, go uh, stress on the point that the approach is still very similar, right? We're still keeping them NPO. We're going to give them IV fluids. We're giving them the supportive medications. And in this case, we're starting antibiotics, usually ciproflagyl. Um, if not, your general surgeon will give you another um, option. Ischemic colitis, this is also another big one, um, and it often can be um, overlooked. Um, so these are people who are coming in with generalized colicky abdominal pain, like all the other cases before, this could be anything. Um, bloody stools don't often present until later on in the course of the illness. So 
Um, definitely bloody stool is a red flag for this, especially if it's painful bloody stools. And so a key thing on your lab is your lactate. So someone's coming in with abdominal pain and your lactate's up, you know, I have a high suspicion for ischemic colitis. Uh, they can have an elevated white count and they're probably going to present with metabolic acidosis. Um, CT is really important here um, because it can show ischemic bowel and uh, that will be your direct um, indication for gen surge versus vascular surgery um, to figure out, you know, where is that area of um, ischemia and how do we kind of treat it. Again, aggressive IV fluids, keep them NPO, um, give your analgesia, antiemetics, IV, and antibiotics need to be started. Oftentimes, if they're pretty sick, I just go with Fiptazo. Um, anticoagulations, usually warfarin or heparin, but again, at that point, I'm, I'm getting these specialists involved. Next, we have diverticulitis. Okay, so uh, we have our patient with left lower quadrant pain. Um, they're coming in with fever, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, elevated white count. You know, what do we do? Um, if, if I have that typical left lower quadrant pain, you, these are usually older people with a history of constipation and whatnot, I'm ordering that CT right away. Um, and CT usually comes back and uh, you'll see uh, you know, the extent to, the, uh, to which they have diverticulitis. Now something, sorry, I said I would go to CT right away. If someone is having very mild pain, it's left lower quadrant, their labs are okay and they look really well, I'm not necessarily going for a CT. Um, you know, if they look unwell, the CT is really um, important. And if they've had a history of it, you know, there is some question of whether you need to CT them every time because this could be something that frequently happens. But again, um, that's something you'll discuss with the patient and, and base it off your clinical judgment. Um, usually the role of CT is to see, one, is a diverticulitis and not something else? And two, is there complications? So like an abscess, perforation, and things like that, which would be surgical indications, right? If it's uncomplicated, um, they're doing pretty well, they're able to tolerate oral food, um, then I'm giving them a low residue diet. So that's a low fiber diet. I usually just Google it, print it out and give it to them. Um, antibiotics, you know, some people are saying it may not be necessary. So I usually give a script and say, you know, if you're not feeling better, start it. Um, but, you know, some people choose not to, some people do. Uh, and the antibiotics usually are um, Cipro and Flagyl, again, your usual abdo uh, antibiotics. You can give amoxiclab, you can give Septra as well. Um, for inpatient, um, sorry, for inpatient uh, management, again, your usual NPO, gen surge, um, aggressive fluids, and supportive therapy with antibiotics, this time IV antibiotics. The thing to remember is whether you're discharging or keeping them in, if this is a newly diagnosed um, diverticulitis, they do need a follow-up colonoscopy in six weeks. So I usually give them um, a gen surge consult uh, for a scope uh, at that point, because you can't really rule out uh, malignancy as a trigger. Okay, so I'm gonna try to whiz through urological emergencies because they're very, I guess, similar in at least the ones I'm covering. So. The most common thing I often see in eMERGE, especially in the lower acuity area, is do I have a UTI? And so these are patients coming in with lower urinary tract symptoms. That's what LUTS stands for. So that's, um, I have a fun acronym that I forgot to put up. It's called FUNDWISE. Um, so frequency, urgency, nocturia, not so much, but dysuria, um, weak stream. So all your lower urinary tract symptom um, Things that they come with. So Google FundWise if you don't find it. Um, so I ask about all those symptoms. I ask about fever, any flank or back pain. Well, with usual regular run-of-the-mill UTIs, you don't have any of that. So um, I'm doing, in terms of labs, and just, you know, usually the urine is already taken by the nurse because they're so awesome. Um, and then I see uh, the urine, and what I'm looking for is nitrites. Obviously, that's more of a slam dunk with symptoms. Um, but if they have some lukes and some blood, let's just say, um, you know, that can really be from a bunch of things that could be from a, st uh, from a stone, it can be infection. But if I see that with someone who has clear symptoms, then I probably would treat that. Again, 
do not treat asymptomatic bacteriuria, okay? If you're finding someone says, yeah, I have a little bit of pain in my abdomen and the urine's like positive for loops um, and that's it, I'm not necessarily treating that as a UTI. I need to find out what else is going on. Um, the only time that I would kind of treat blindly is if someone's coming in with delirium, it's an older person, they can't describe their symptoms to me. And so in that case, I might uh, be treating it even if they're not symptomatic. Your usual UTI management is the same as in family medicine. Um, so, you know, phosphomycin, one dose, Macrobid, Septra, Keflex, Cipro. Cipro, Cipro I usually don't give right away. Um, it has more intense side effects and interactions. So um, I reserve those for prostatitis or whatnot. Now, when do we consider inpatient management? So this could be an elder person who's delirious. This could be someone who is septic. Um, from the UTI because they didn't get treated in time and it just got worse and worse. Oftentimes these are males who have BPH and so a bit of obstructive um, situation going on there. And so in that case, I'm giving their, them IV antibiotics, IV fluids and admitting them. Don't forget STIs can cause uh, lower urinary tract symptoms as well. So usually with my workup, I'm adding that um, gonorrhea, chlamydia, if they're kind of a high risk kind of patient um, and in that case, I'm treating them prophylactically, or um, maybe I, I'll tell them, you know, let's treat you for the UTI right now, and we'll give you a call if it's positive, in which case, at that point, they'll be called back for their septrax and their zithro. Um, I'm not going to go through all the doses here, but again, these slides are for you, and that's why I kept it so detailed. Um, I know there's always other options. These are just my go-tos. Um, other emergencies. So people who are coming in with flank pain, back pain, and uh, potential fever, um, the biggest thing that, you know, differentiates for me pylo versus UTI is CVA tenderness um, and kind of a worse, worsened presentation. So these are people who are like, yeah, I have all my urinary symptoms. I have, I have a fever. And you know, my back hurts. And so sometimes you won't really, you know, pick up on that. But, uh, you know, what, I don't know if everyone, I guess the psych residents here who haven't done an abdo exam in a while, um, maybe time to take out that handbook. But essentially you're going um, on the back, you put your hand like this on their back and then I tap. And so that light tap, I hope everyone saw that, um, that light tap will really make them jump. And so that jump makes me think, you know, there's probably hydronephrosis, so there's some sort of irritation to the kidneys. Um, I'm concerned for pyelonephritis. And so in that case, if they're otherwise well, they're tolerating oral medications, I'm gonna give them oral um, meds for their pyelonephritis. Similar antibiotics as UTI, but they are longer in duration. And the only one I will remind you, Macrobid, aka nitrofurantoin, does not treat pylo. Um, so you can't give that one for pyelonephritis. So in that case, you know, my go-tos are Cipro, Septra, Keflex, um, for pyelonephritis. Inpatient management is uh, when I'm concerned they're not able to tolerate orally. I'm concerned for sepsis. They're an elderly person. They're just not um, doing well. Again, really important. I'm going to start IV antibiotics and get them admitted. Renal colic. Okay, so um, this is also a really common presentation. Someone comes in, they're saying, oh my god, I have this crazy back pain. Um, and they're vomiting, they're just in so much pain, sometimes they're sweaty, and they look really unwell sometimes. And you start worrying and, you know, again, calm down, nothing in a pandemic is an emergency, first of all. And second, you know, as long as you have your ABCs down, you have some time to think. So get your ABCs, they're, they're alert oriented, they're sitting, they have pain start with pain management in this case. So oftentimes when I give the pain management, um, I know their vitals are okay, um, I'm good to go, and then I will reassess. I order the urine, uh, maybe a blood culture, STI workup if I'm concerned. Um, and if I find nothing else in the abdomen, um, other than maybe CVA tenderness, I'm moving on to potentially abdo ultrasound or even um, a KUB X-ray in case the stone is visible. Now, I don't always do an x-ray because it's just, it doesn't tell me much. I mean, sometimes it'll be negative. Sometimes um, it won't give me the size. I'm not really, you know, as, like, I don't find it as useful unless I'm thinking of other causes there too. But um, an ultrasound is usually uh, sufficient to assess for hydronephrosis. Sometimes they can see the stone, sometimes they don't. 
And so again, if my pain management is, is working and they're tolerating oral meds, I'm not really going to rush into getting imaging done per se, especially if they have a history of renal colic. Um, again, this is assuming that all my other workup is negative. Now, when do we do inpatient care or when do we get urologists involved? That's usually when the stone is large. Um, stones that are sitting in the kidney itself that are not causing any obstruction, it doesn't matter how big they are. They're not really cons like worrisome. I mean, I shouldn't say it doesn't matter, but um, usually they're, they're not gonna obstruct and cause any issues. But if this is a person whose stone is more than five millimeters and it's going down, usually they end up being um, more difficult uh, to get out. And so I usually get uro involved or if they're, um, they have infected urine and so I'm worried about um, a septic stone, if they have a single kidney or if they have bilateral stones, if they're pregnant or they have intractable pain, these are all reasons to potentially admit or get urology involved. Um, and in that case, you know, inpatient management for high-risk patients for pilo or uro, you know, I'm going to use similar antibiotics because this could be a septic stone. But before I do that, you know, I would want to talk to the uh, urologist or uh, the admitting doctor. And that brings us to the end of abdo pain. I will now give it to Say for a quick um, ED snappers. All right, team, let's blow through these bad boys really quick because they're supposed to be quick ED snappers for a reason. So <clears throat> first one, Emergency departments are places people come when they're in pain, so manage their pain. We know that patient satisfaction scores go through the roof if they're not uncomfortable or in pain. So there are lots of different ways to manage pain. Each way you're going to do it will be unique to the patient's needs. I'm doing a Peds Emerge Fellowship, which means I use a lot of topical pain management, and then I use a lot of intranasal pain management because anytime I poke a patient, they're screaming, and most kids don't take oral medications. Um, other things that can cause a lot of distress in the emergency department are, of course, anxiety and vomiting. So be thinking about these things as needed for each of your patients. Now, I've added like the intravenous and sedative options because some of these patients are going to need a true procedural sedation. And that's when you're going to start thinking about adding things like ketamine and benzos and propofol to their management. But I just wanted to point this out there and kind of get you thinking that not all things are going to be Tylenol and Advil and not all pain management needs to happen by IV or by mouth. Um, quickly about principles of laceration repair. The big thing here is that you don't want to be missing a more serious injury and you don't want to be causing more harm than good. So in your physical exam, consider the anatomic locations that you would not suture. So for me, a lot of these involve the eye. Up, oh, those scares me. So anything that has fat extrusion, involves the lid, or involves any of the um, actual tear ducts is not going to be touched by me. If the patient has globe rupture, I'm not adding extra pressure and, um, and, uh, I'll turn my video on. I'm not going to add extra pressure by trying to suture. I'm just going to call up though and get the experts to handle it. Um, the other thing that's tricky to suture is the vermilion border of the lip. We know that if you have the vermilion border off by less than uh, one fourth of a millimeter, then um, if by more than one fourth of a millimeter, then the eye can actually see it. And it's like, oh, look at you. You have a scar there. So really make sure you're lining up that vermilion border perfectly when you go to suture it. All of your assessment should include that neurovascular assessment and ask yourself, are they bleeding arterially? And is the nerve involved? And then look at their function, especially on the hand. You wanna make sure you're not missing a flexor or extensor tendon injury or a nerve injury there. Different parts on history are gonna, are gonna prompt you to manage the patient differently. So animal bites are considered super dirty and high risk and will need antibiotics. Dirty wounds are at higher risk for tetanus and really should be cleaned out well. Getting that tetanus history is important because if your patient hasn't had a tetanus shot, then they might need immun immunoglobulin. And then think of your timing. If the patient's had an injury that's after 18 hours, unless it's on the face, I'm probably not going to repair it because the risk of infection is just too high. And then um, any bleeding disorders, immunocompromised, or allergies to the medications you'd be using to close the wound need to be considered as well. When it comes to choosing your, your suture material, um, if it's on a joint or somewhere that's going to be under a lot of tension, I typically go with proline because I want it to last. If it's on the face, I want something that's really skinny, and I prefer actually things that um, just remove themselves. So there I would use a uh, Vicryl Rapid or Fast Absorbing Gut, um, always at the 6-0 level. And then anything that's going to be deep sutured, you really make sure you use that um, self-absorbing uh, material and not something like proline that'll last for forever and 
cause a lot of pain and discomfort later on down the line. I would highly recommend using a simple interrupted suture as demonstrated here. It's easy and it works. The thing that I don't like about this diagram is they show you closing it like a zipper down along one line. I always think about closing my wounds so that I decrease tension. So I would start in the middle, align the edges, and then cut things into halves slowly as I go along to make sure I'm not putting one area under more tension than another or ending up with a dog-eared edge at the very end. The other two types of sutures here shown are a horizontal mattress and a vertical mattress. I tend to use a horizontal mattress if I'm trying to pull the skin together and close a great distance, and I use a vertical mattress if the wound is really deep. Suture removal happens at different times based on where it is in the body. So for the face, I would wait only three to five days max because the longer you leave it in there, the higher the risk they'll get that uh, train track type scarring. If it's on somewhere that's under high tension and flexion like the knee, well then it's gonna have to last a little bit longer, up to 10 to 14 days. And then the trunk actually needs a lot of time as well, so seven to 10 days there. Approaches to fractures. Quick and easy, ask yourself, where is it? Is it open or is it closed? If it's open, it needs to go to the OR to be cleaned out and they need antibiotics. Ask yourself, what's my neurovascular assessment? Do they have pulses? Do they have good caprofil? Is there pallor? Do they have normal sensation? And despite the pain, do they have normal function? And then imaging, think of your two by two by two. So two joints, the joint above, the joint below. Two angles, because you need to recreate a 3D picture in your head of the affected limb. And then two times, pre and post reduction. Okay, here's some quick pictures, guys. Have a look, what's this fracture? In three, two, one. If you said coles, you'd be correct. This is an extra articular distal radial fracture with dorsal displacement and volar angle angulation. Sorry, this is five, five minute warning. What? Five minute warning. Oh, okay. A dinner fork deformity, and this needs to be reduced so that you have appropriate lengthening and that uh, volar apex angulation is taken out of play there. What's this one? It's a scaphoid. Remember that even if you don't see um, the classical findings on x-ray, if your patient has a lot of pain at the anatomic snuff box or with axial loading of the thumb, you're going to want to put that patient in a Spica cast and get them re-imaged seven days to 10 days later to make sure there's no fracture there. These are at really high risk for avascular necrosis and you would hate to miss that and give these patients osteoarthritis later on down the line. What's this one? Mm-hmm, you see it there. This is a boxer's fracture. This is a scrappy young lady. I'm sure of it. So that's volar angulation of the fifth metacarpal. It needs to be reduced if you're seeing more than 40 degrees of angulation there. I can typically reduce these with a good um, ulnar nerve block or hematoma block in that area, and then you just pop it out to length. You splint these in an ulnar gutter. If you don't get good reduction, they need to go to plastics because the hand is an important part of the body. This one, nice and easy, is a proximal humeral fracture. You'll get ortho to have a look at these, but at the end of the day, most of these are managed conservatively with a cuff and a collar. And so you can actually get the patient into that position early when they present because it can be quite um, comforting for them. And then recommend that they do things like sleep sitting upright so that gravity can constantly be pulling on that bone to pull it into place. This is just gonna remind you that the auto ankle rules exist. And if you're wondering about whether or not a patient needs imaging of a painful ankle, I would use these to help guide your direction. I know in the emergency department that the truth is, is patients show up and they're thinking they're gonna get an x-ray and it's usually easier to just x-ray it anyways. But as we deal with the pandemic, my goal will be to keep patients out of the emergency department and their stay as short as possible. So I'll be leaning more heavily on these Ottawa ankle rules. And then the other one that comes to emerge and pretty much nowhere else unless you do ENT is epistaxis. So my quick pearls are don't miss signs of hemorrhagic shock. Don't forget to ask about any anticoagulation that they're on or whether or not they have any bleeding disorders. And remember that TXA here is your friend. So my typical management when they come to emerge is I get them to blow their nose, get rid of all the clots, and then apply appropriate pressure to the right spot. Everybody likes to pinch the bony ridge and then lean their head back. Wrong, absolutely wrong. You wanna pinch on the fleshy part, apply lots of pressure, lean forward, and you need to hold that pressure for 10 to 20 minutes nonstop. Because most patients are really bad at following directions, I either use like a plastic nose plug that is available in most ENT carts, or I'll make my own by taking two um, popsicle sticks, taping the top together, and then sliding that over the nose so it stays nice and pitched until I can reassess the patient 10 to 20 minutes later. If they're still bleeding, I'll pack it and then I'll put the, the pinchers back on again. I usually use a slurry combination of lidocaine for pain control, Adrenaline for vasoconstriction and transoxamic acid for clots. Um, this TXA actually shows that it works really well. When compared to patients who don't have the TXA, their bleeding stops 
72% of the time in 10 minutes compared to only about 30% of the time. And that re-bleeding is actually quite significantly decreased, only 5% in 24 hours compared to 21% in 24 hours. The other thing is that these patients were out of the emergency department much quicker. So when patients got TXA, they were out of the department within um, two hours for 73% of the patients compared to 20% of the patients who had um, uh, anterior nasal packing done. If they're still bleeding after that slurry, which is rare, then I would, I would visualize the area and look for areas of like extreme um, excoriation or bleeding in um, Kesselbeck's plexus. And that's where I would use my silver cautery. I caution you to only use cautery on one half of the nose, like one there, because the risk is that you can cause perforation if you try to do it on both sides. And if your patient is really hemorrhaging, bleeding a lot, just use a rapid rhino. They're the best. My only trick and tip here is that you have to use uh, sterile water. Don't use normal saline. Use sterile water because that's what activates the, the clotting agents that are actually on the, the rapid rhino. And then my last thing, just because it's so important not to miss, is don't forget that all female patients are fertile, pregnant, and ectopic until proven otherwise. So make sure you get that beta HCG to rule out their pregnancy. And that's all I have to say. I'm going to stop sharing now, and I think we're going to do questions. Yep. Thank you again to Say and Tanzila for the excellent talk. So I just have a list of questions. Uh, I know Say has answered a bunch of them already, and so has Tanzila in the chat. Um, so I'm just going to skip to the ones that we have outstanding, and then we'll go from there. Um, so first question, Tanzila, do I need to unmute you? I don't know if I, you can unmute yourself. Give me one second. Uh, there okay. you go. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So first question is um, going back to at the very beginning. If you do identify anatomical difficulties in your Lemons assessment, i.e., uh, microcnathia, uh, what do you do differently? Um. I would think about bringing on uh, an airway expert. So emergency medicine is crash airways if we need to, but someone like anesthesia or ENT, who's more typically used to dealing with these anatomic um, abnormalities, would be a safer bet to capture that airway. Perfect. Okay, so next question. When do we give specific blood products, i.e. fibrinogen, fresh frozen plasma, et cetera? I think you already answered this in the chat, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I typically hit them with fresh, fresh frozen plasma at that point. Um, and then uh, as needed, I know in my emergency department, anyone who's bleeding, we can send tags and we'll actually get like the products we need back to fix it from our, our hematology group. So I kind of cheat. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Awesome. Any suggestions or examples for types of synthetic occlusive dressings? No. <laughs> okay. I always forget what it's called. Um, but it's like that gauze that's covered in that plasticky, like really mild plastic. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, what it's called. Um, next question was, can you explain using glucagon when a patient is on a beta blocker? So it's, it's uh, one milligram. Um, I believe it's IM. And um, again, you, you give it to, it's dose to response basically. I have never really used it. I don't know, have you say? I think, like I'm thinking back to my toxicology and everything like that, it has something to do with the fact that beta blockers are affecting your beta receptors and decreasing the effectiveness of like epi on your anaphylactic response, I think. Um, I'm not a very smart doctor, I'm a practical doctor, um, but it has something to do with that. So you wanna basically take the beta blocker out of the picture by giving the antidote to beta blocker, which is glucagon, and then just focusing on the anaphylaxis. Okay. Uh, next question was, um, is there a limit to the number of times you can repeat epi? No. It's a crash. For yeah. um, my recommendation would be if you've given a second dose and you're worried about giving a third dose, have your epi infusion ready to go because they're probably going to need it. But you can continue dosing epi until you get an infusion titrated to effect. Just remember that your, your push dose for epinephrine and anaphylaxis is always intramuscular. Don't push a dose IV. You titrate and an infusion IV. Okay. In terms of initial resuscitation, careful fluids or one to two liter bolus, given that there's already some bilateral edema. I think this might have been related to a specific case, but. Yeah, so, so I'm, you know, in eMERGE, the thing is they're not going to leave you. They're not running away. So I'm really a big believer on reassessing a lot. 
And so usually, you know, if they have a history of CHF, I'm actually doing 500 CC boluses, not even a liter. Um, and I'm just reassessing. And, it, you know, even if they're, um, you know, septic and whatnot, I, I'm around. And so that's my go-to. Now, if I get overwhelmed in the future, I don't know what I'll do. Maybe in that case, one liter. But I never really just say put two liters in, like for an otherwise okay patient. If it's a trauma patient or something like they're unconscious and really unwell, that's different. You know, you want your large four IVs and you're giving it. Um, but I think that question may have came uh, with just um, septic shock or something like that. <clears throat> and so it's also saying yeah, that for, the case was for the tamponade. And so there, your, your cause is obstructive shock. And so your goal is to basically put in enough fluid into your tank so that you're on that peak part of the Frank Sterling curve. So smaller boluses are more effective there because the risk is you'll go over, you'll stretch the heart and it'll get less effective. So there, I think that 500 cc bolus is a safer way to go. And also for that, you know, dobutamine is an inotrope and you really want that inotrope support as well. So it's not just the fluid, it's a balance of both. And obviously you want to take away your offending factor, which is that fluid around the heart. Otherwise, no matter what you give, it's just going to reaccumulate and it's not going to fill, it's not going to pump. So first thing there is really getting that fluid out. Awesome. And the final question I have here, um, I think this is from the PE slide or but what if there's recent surgery or something like that? Will it elevate the D-dimer? Yeah, it definitely can. So you have to think about D-dimer is basically just your body um, measuring clot breakdown. And so if you have clot burden in other places, you will have a falsely elevated uh, D-dimer um, or potentially it'll just be weird regardless. So I think that if you've got like recent surgery, if your patient has a history of clots in the past and they're already anticoagulated, if there's been recent trauma or recent pregnancy, your D-dimer is going to be less effective. And really there, use your clinical gestalt. Um, that's why all of the scoring tools like Wells and Years has so many points provided to your clinical gestalt. Use it, go for it. All right. Um, I have another question that just came in here. So for COVID patients with cardiac disorder, for which we cannot prescribe hydroxychloroquine, what should we do? You can't prescribe hydroxychloroquine? I guess, I guess the concern might be QT. Yeah. I guess, so I mean, the evidence behind hydroxychloroquine isn't awesome yet. Mm -hmm. um, what I would say is that like, we're, we're focusing mostly in Canada on good supportive management. So, you know, um, optimize their ventilation and oxygenation. If they're having myocardial um, uh, injury, as because we know that a lot of these patients end up with like a myocarditis and myositis as well, then add your, your pressors. We're finding that epi is a better first line presser for these patients. And then adding on things like dibutamine um, or even milrinone might be needed. There's actually brand new surviving sepsis guidelines for COVID-19. And it's actually a really good read and I highly recommend it if this is, if this is what you're worried about. And the other thing I wanna say with COVID-19 is, you know, we have COVID-19 happening, but we also have pneumonias happening. Um, these are patients who are gonna have bilateral pneumonias. These are patients who could have an underlying bacterial infection. And so, you know, my clinical suspicion is high for COVID, but I'm probably going to start my usual sepcaraxin and azithro until I get the swab back, um, in which case, you know, I'll reevaluate and probably stop that. But um, really important to stay broad with emerge, um, you know, our, our real emergencies still do happen despite COVID. It could be an abdo pain person coming in um, and they end up with COVID as well. Um, and so, you know, make sure you're wearing your PPE and treat them as if you would with out and with COVID. Um, so keep your differentials broad. Yeah. And right now we're seeing in the emergency department that people aren't wanting to come in because they're worried about catching COVID in the hospital. So the ones that are coming in are dying. Every appy I've seen lately has been a perforated appy with a septic uh, picture. So yeah. just patients are sick right now, guys. All right, give me one second. I'm just going to confirm that there's no other um, I'm just reading through the chat and I love that you guys are giving us suggestions for other topics. I was going to cover DKA, but as you can tell, there's like no time. Gynae emergencies we wanted to cover, so maybe we'll do that later. Um, and I love that you guys want to know more about a COVID refresher. And actually, um, Nazia, uh, Sharf, Dr. Sharfuddin and Dr. Hamza Qureshi, um, who did the talk last week, will be doing a Q&A session on COVID-19, um, hopefully this Wednesday if possible. So everyone who's on right now, 
like you guys, you know, they did an amazing job last week. You can also look at their lecture last week. So we tried not to do too much COVID-19 because they went into it um, in more depth there. So look at that and then maybe tune in on Wednesday and hopefully we'll have more refreshers coming uh, with ID and whatnot as well. So, yeah. And um, the other thing is, you know, this was organized by the Muslim Medical Association of Canada. Um, it's open to all. There's like, you know, our, our goal is to increase um, knowledge in the medical community. And so if you guys have some um, time, you know, check out our website, give a bit of a donation so that we can keep these going. Um, we also do a lot of community stuff like outreach and whatnot. And it's uh, ironically, it, it's not necessarily religion specific where we, everything's open to everyone. Um, and also on our website, we have a really good COVID-19 resource going. Um, things for your patients, things for, um, you know, documents put together by ID specialists as well. So that's also a great resource. So check it out. Awesome. Um, some people are asking about dates of the upcoming sessions. Follow along on the website um, or on our Facebook page or social media. Um, and we will have that stuff um, on there. Oh, there's one more question. Yep. Sorry, one second. Yes, uh, Shaji, go ahead. And then I'm gonna wrap it up after this one. Can we please know the dates? Uh, no, sorry, what's the, hello? Yeah, I'm just waiting for them to send the question over. Oh, okay, okay. The other thing I wanna say is um, in terms of schedule, so I just wanna like thank everyone who's been involved in this. Um, Say and I put this together in 48 hours, I'm gonna say, or maybe 24, <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, but we are basically, you know, doing this on the fly. The more cases we see, the more um, quickly we're trying to act and get you guys prepared in case we need a bigger team. And so if you're a specialist, if you're an ID specialist, if you're an IC specialist, whatever, reach out to us if you want to give out uh, lectures. Um, you know, so we don't have a concrete schedule per se. It's kind of like, here's the demand. Let's address it. Let's try to get all our people up to date on these things. So, and I apologize for any mistakes I may have had. Um, you know, I will be giving those slides with doses and stuff. Um, always, you know, double check. There could be a typo here and there. So I apologize, but um, that's it. So that, our final question is yeah. right, oh, where did it go? Right now, the recommendation is that N95 only for aerosol generating procedures, such as bronch, intubation, et cetera but can coughing not also produce aerosols as well? So the question is around uh, PPE and what to use. And so why not use N95 for a usual, quote unquote, uh, patient interaction, such as when doing a history and physical? So when they did the studies to decide that COVID-19 was potentially airborne, they used one of the atomizers that basically measures the strength of a bomb. So they like took a bunch of COVID-19, put it through this like bomb-like atomizer and then saw what happened. And of course it aerosolized. When we look at the pressures that a human being can generate with their own like pulmonary intrathoracic coughing, we're saying that it's probably not going to be aerosolizing. Now, of course, as we get more experience with this virus, that might change. But right now, what we're seeing clinically is that we create good droplet and COVID-19 is a wicked fomite with a long lasting shelf life on a lot of different materials, but we're not seeing that patients themselves can generalize an, an aerosol. So it can't become airborne. However, when we're doing procedures like intubation and also like using suction and things like that, there's just other factors at play that can potentially cause aerosolization. Um, and then the other thing that happens with our aerosolizing medical procedures is that the practitioners are really in close to the patient. And so the viral load that they're getting is really high. And so that's why we're suggesting use of a face mask and an N95 for those procedures. And, and I suggest face mask with the visor is really important. Um, yeah, so I think evidence is gonna be changing, but I think we need to stick to conserving our N95s for those procedures for now until and unless we know otherwise. Wash your hands, don't touch your face. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. So with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you so much for everybody for joining us today. Um, that was a great lecture. Thank you so much, Tanzila and Say, uh, for putting together this great session. Um, hopefully it was beneficial for everybody involved. And we look forward to having you guys involved in the future sessions as well. Thank you. All right. Have a good weekend, guys. Stay safe.